I grew up in the shadow of Mount Rainier, Washington, in the 1980s. My name is Salali, and even as a kid, I felt a connection to this place, an echo of my ancestors and the whispers of the wind through the evergreens. I spent days hiking with my dad, learning to track deer, watching eagles circle lazily above the snow-capped peaks. Dad was a park ranger, old school, believed the best way to protect these wilds was simply to know them inside and out. He loved his job, even though it didn't pay much. Then the logging companies came. Dad watched them tear into those untouched forests with cold fury in his eyes. I saw him start drinking more, getting short-tempered at home. It scared me. I was a scrawny kid, not tough, but I got stubborn about wanting to understand where that anger came from. So, while normal teenagers were playing this Pac-Man at the arcade, I pestered the tribal elders until they shared the old stories. It was their way, I suppose, of planting a seed. One story stuck with me. They said there was a spirit in the woods that the old ones called Tiesamequis. They didn't worship it, exactly, but treated it with respect, even a touch of fear. Huge and hairy, strong enough to uproot trees if it felt like it. Dad always said, Bigfoot's just a legend. But those old tales gave me chills. Then came the summer that changed everything. I was fifteen, restless, and convinced Dad needed some cheering up after a particularly brutal battle with the loggers. I decided we were going to climb to the fire lookout on Granite Peak. Dad hadn't been up there for years. I made a big show of packing our old backpacks, and we set off early one morning, a bit of the old spirit back in his stride. The hike was hard, a relentless scramble up switchbacks that tested my scrawny legs. But Dad was in better spirits, even pointing out a woodpecker drumming away high on a dead pine. We ate our lunch overlooking a sea of green that stretched all the way to the horizon. Pretty amazing sight for a city kid like me. That's when I saw the first sign, a set of footprints near an old campsite. Massive prints, way too big for a human. I froze, then looked at Dad. He was staring too, the grin wiped off his face. Can't be, he muttered, but his voice was shaky. That was when we heard a noise, like a tree cracking, over by the ridge. Dad and I exchanged a look. He reached for the rifle he always carried, eyes narrowed. Something moved on the ridge, something massive and dark against the skyline. It looked like a silhouette of a giant gorilla hunched over, walking upright. We watched, hardly daring to breathe, until it disappeared back into the trees. It was clear as day, no hallucination. It was Tiesamequis, or whatever else you want to call it, and it was real. My dad and I didn't talk much on the way down the mountain that day, each of us wrapped up in our own thoughts. In the weeks that followed, things got weird. Dad kept taking me out into the woods on weekends. He wouldn't talk about what we saw, but he was focused, like a man on a mission. He tracked footprints, made plaster casts, always keeping his rifle close at hand. It made me nervous, like we were hunting something, not just watching it. Then, late one August night, Dad woke me up. Get dressed, quiet as you can, he whispered, his eyes gleaming in the moonlight. We slipped out, hopped into his old truck, and drove for over an hour deeper into the woods than I'd ever been. Finally, he stopped at the edge of a logging road, the moonlight glinting off the clear-cut stumps that stretched up a hillside like broken tombstones. He shouldered the rifle, flashlight cutting through the gloom. Stay close, he said voice low. We started walking uphill, the ground uneven, branches whipping at our faces. The air was thick with the smell of cut pine. That's when it hit me. It was the same musky, 
animal scent I'd smelled near the footprints that first day on the peak. We went deeper. Suddenly, Dad stopped, raising a fist. I heard it too, a low grunt, a rustling. My knees turned to jelly, but Dad pulled me close, his grip on the rifle tightening. He flicked on his flashlight, beams slicing through the darkness. There, twenty feet away, was a pair of glowing eyes, yellow like a cat's, fixed on us from within a thicket of saplings. It was crouched, hard to make out its exact shape in the shadows, but I knew, instantly and without the shadow of a doubt, that this was Tiesimekwis. The creature let out a rumbling growl, exposing rows of long, sharp teeth. Dad slowly raised his rifle. I wanted to run, scream, melt into the forest floor, but I was held captive by those gleaming eyes. As my dad took aim, the thicket exploded. The creature erupted towards us with a terrifying bellow. My heart hammered in my chest like a trapped bird trying to break free. I shut my eyes tight, expecting the impact. But instead of pain and claws, I heard a gunshot the sound echoing through the night. There was a roar of pain that cut off abruptly. When I dared to look, expecting to see Dad sprawled on the ground, a different sight met my eyes. He stood firm, the rifle still smoking, his gaze fixed on the ground in front of him. And there, at his feet, was the massive slump form of Tiesimekwis, utterly still. I gaped, unable to make a sound. The creature that had loomed so large in the forest, in my nightmares, was dead. Dad lowered his rifle. His whole body seemed to slump with a weariness that was more than just physical exertion. It had to be done, he said, voice thick, his hand shaking as he fumbled for a cigarette. Numbly, I followed as he walked closer, the flashlight wobbling in my grip. Up close, the creature looked less monstrous, and shockingly, more familiar. There was thick hair matted with mud, yes, but under the dirt I could see a face that was disturbingly human in its structure. The yellow eyes were open, glazed in death, and in them, I saw a reflection of both fear and loss. We didn't say much as we worked. Dad had rope in the truck, shovels, tarps. The logistics were grim, but carried out with a kind of grim efficiency I hadn't seen in him for years. By the time the first rays of dawn painted the sky gray, there was no trace of Tiesimekwis left, no blood, no sign of what had transpired on that logging road. We drove home in silence. Things changed for Dad after that night. Something settled in him, a heavy kind of peace. He quit drinking, started smiling more. When the loggers came, he argued his points based on clean water and forest health rather than rage. He still saw the forest as a place to protect, but it was a kinder vision than before. He even started telling the old tribal stories at the community center, including the one about Tiesimekwis. At first, I figured he just lost it, gone nuts from the stress or the encounter. But then, one night months later, after I'd gotten my driver's license, we were driving home late. As we passed a familiar clear-cut, a shiver went down my spine. Dad saw it too. He pulled over to the side of the road, and we got out, walking to the edge of the barren hillside. It was a clear night, the Milky Way like a river of diamonds across the sky. Dad cleared his throat. The stories talk about Tiesimekwis like it was some monster, but maybe, maybe we were the monsters all along. Dad, what happened that night? I asked, needing the words out in the open. He didn't answer directly. Instead, he told me something else, about the old ways, the balance of things. He talked about how his people had always taken from the land, but also gave back. How Tiesimekwis, it wasn't something they hunted, it just was. A force, a spirit, and maybe a warning too. 
We forgot how to listen, Dad said, staring at the moonlit stumps as if they were ghosts. We cut and took without asking. That creature, maybe it was the last of its kind. Maybe it was angry, scared, the way a cornered animal turns dangerous. He looked at me with a pain in his eyes that mirrored my own. And maybe, in the end, it saw no other way to protect what was left. We stayed there for a long time, either of us talking, just breathing in the cool night air. The truth was sinking in. In our pursuit of that creature, driven by fear, anger, and maybe some twisted sense of scientific curiosity, we had become the very thing the elders tried to warn against. Dad never went back into those deep woods again. He spent the rest of his days as a ranger fighting the good fight, the legal fight, educating the next generation. As for me, the encounter never left me. I saw it in the rising tides, the choking smoke of wildfires, and the receding glaciers on Rainier. I studied ecology in college, then environmental law. The fight changed form, but the core purpose was the same. Some nights, I still dream of Tiesimekwis, those yellow eyes burning in the dark. The old ones named it, but maybe they were naming a feeling— a primal fear rooted in the knowledge of the damage we were capable of inflicting upon the world. When I wake in a cold sweat, I remind myself that monsters aren't always born, sometimes they're made. And sometimes, the only way to defeat the darkness is to confront the part of it that lives within ourselves. It was early 1988 when I went on that trek through the green mountains of Vermont. You know how people say they go into the woods for some peace and solitude? Well, I guess I'm not one of those people. I like the mountains, sure, but really I just need an excuse to be away from the city, the traffic, the noise. Makes me feel more human somehow. I always head up to Killington Peak. It's a tough climb but the view is worth it. This time, though, I wanted something more challenging. I dug up an old trail guide and found a route marked. Experienced hikers only. Seemed like a good way to make a long weekend interesting, so I packed my gear and headed north. The first day was just like any other hike. Hard work, beautiful scenery, zero people. Just the way I like it found a sheltered little clearing near a stream, made camp, ate a simple dinner, and crawled into my sleeping bag early the first night. Hiking solo like that, there isn't much to do after sundown. When I woke up on the second day, something felt off. No birds, no rustling of squirrels in the brush, just silence. It was unnerving, but I brushed it off. Weather can change fast in the mountains. I had breakfast, broke camp, and got back on the trail. That's when the real trouble started. About an hour into my hike, something crashed through the trees off to my left. It sounded huge, and I froze, my heart pounding. Whatever it was, it didn't come out onto the trail, so after a few tense moments, I cautiously pushed onward. I tried to convince myself it was just a bear or a moose, but I'd never heard anything move with that much force. The rest of the morning was filled with an uneasy tension. I kept seeing movement out of the corner of my eye, always disappearing before I got a good look. Then, the footprints started. They were massive, bigger than any human could make, and misshapen, as if something had been walking on mangled feet. The trail was winding its way up a steep ridge, and I knew I couldn't stick to it anymore. The trees were thicker on either side of the path, offering better cover, so I veered off. Problem was, the trail guide was now useless. I was navigating by instinct, hoping I could loop back eventually. That afternoon, I heard what sounded like an animal in pain. 
A low, groaning howl echoed through the trees, followed by wet ripping noises. I wanted more than anything to turn and run, but what I saw froze me in place. Standing on a boulder less than fifty yards away was the largest, ugliest creature I have ever seen in my life. It looked vaguely human, maybe seven feet tall, but hunched over and covered in coarse, filthy hair. Its limbs were too long, its hands almost dragging along the ground, and its face— it was like some twisted caricature of a man, with a jutting jaw and eyes that shone an unnatural yellow in the dim forest light. I was certain it hadn't seen me yet, so I slowly lowered myself to the ground, trying to become one with the undergrowth. That's when it turned its head towards me. For a heartbeat, those grotesque yellow eyes locked with mine, and a primal wave of terror crashed over me. Somehow, I knew in that instant this thing was more than just a mutated animal. There was a cruel intelligence behind its gaze. I scrambled to my feet and ran. I didn't care about the trail, didn't care if I even knew where I was going. The sounds of it crashing through the woods behind me spurred me on, and I ran like my life depended on it, because it did. That night I hid in a tiny cave I'd stumbled across too terrified to sleep. The thing kept circling in the darkness, sometimes growling, sometimes scratching at the rocks, but it never came inside. Just before dawn, the sounds finally ceased, and I drifted into a fitful, fear-filled sleep. The next morning, I was battered and exhausted, but alive. My first thought was getting out of those woods. With no trail to follow, I just picked a direction and moved, trying to ignore my trembling muscles and gnawing hunger. Then, late in the afternoon, the trees broke, and I emerged onto a dirt road. Relief flooded over me. I had made it, until I saw the cruiser parked at the end of the road, its lights flashing. That's when I knew something was horribly wrong. Two officers stepped out as I approached. They were grim-faced, and their eyes kept flicking over my shoulder as if expecting something to follow me out of the woods. That was when they told me. Told me about the missing hikers, the reports of something inhuman in those hills, the mangled corpses they'd found. I told them everything I knew, trying to describe the creature I'd seen. Their expressions never changed, but there was a flicker of something in their eyes. Recognition, maybe? It was almost as unsettling as the thing in the woods itself. They didn't press for many details. They just seemed relieved I was alive. I hitched a ride to the nearest town, then home. It's months later now, and I still see that thing when I close my eyes, still feel the terror of that desperate run through the trees. Every creak of my apartment floor makes me jump, makes me wonder if somehow it followed me back. They never caught up with it, whatever it was, and the disappearances in those mountains stopped after I escaped. Some folks called me a hero, said I'd saved others from that thing. They don't know the truth. I'm not a hero, I'm just the one who got away. And that creature, whatever it might be, it's still out there. I have only to look at the scars on my legs from my frantic flight to know that it's real. The green mountains haven't seen the last of me. I have unfinished business there, and as scared as I am, I have to try and find it. This happened to me on June 19, 2008. My name's Mike Carter and I work as a deputy for the sheriff's department in Willow Springs, a quiet town tucked away in the Nevada desert. It's the kind of place where everyone knows your name, and excitement mostly comes in the form of the occasional cattle rustling or a domestic dispute a bit too loud for the neighbors to bear. I never thought I'd see the horrors I did. It started with the missing hikers. A couple from California— 
out exploring the rugged beauty of the nearby mountains, vanished without a trace. Their campsite was discovered abandoned, their gear scattered like they'd left in a hurry, but no sign of a struggle. We organized a search party, combed the area for days, but found nothing, no bodies, no clues, nothing to indicate what could have happened to them. Folks started getting spooked. Hikers canceled their reservations, motels stood half empty, and a low-level dread settled over the town. Sheriff Thompson put it down to wild animal attack, maybe a mountain lion, though we'd never had issues with them before. I wasn't so sure. Something about the whole thing felt off. Things escalated a few weeks later, when old man Watkins went missing from his homestead outside town. Watkins was a grizzled loner, kept to himself mostly, so it took a couple of days before anyone realized he was gone. When we went out to his place, the scene that greeted us made my blood run cold. The small cabin was torn apart. Furniture was smashed, the ground littered with broken glass and splintered wood. There was blood, a lot of it, sprayed across the walls and floor. No sign of Watkins, but whatever had done this wasn't human. The claw marks gouged into the walls were too large, too deep. And that smell, it was a rank, rotten odor I'll never forget. Sheriff Thompson, bless his stubborn heart, still insisted it must be a rogue bear, or maybe some deranged drifter. But I knew in my gut this was something different, something monstrous. It was hunting us, and we had no idea what it was. I started spending my off-shift hours digging through the local library's archives, searching for anything related to strange occurrences, old legends. Deep down, I hoped it was just my imagination running wild, fueled by too much late-night coffee and not enough sleep. But I found it. A tattered scrap of a pioneer journal, detailing attacks on a wagon train passing through the region back in the 1800s. The entries described a creature the settlers called the Skinwalker, a shape-shifting monstrosity steeped in darkness. I dismissed it as old superstition, but doubt not at me. Then it came for me. I was working a late shift, patrolling a deserted stretch of highway that ran along the mountain range. The radio sputtered with static, cutting me off from the station. The air outside was still and heavy, the only sound the crickets chirping and the rumble of my own engine. Suddenly, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. A sense of being watched, a primal fear that sent a shiver down my spine. I scanned the rearview mirror and caught sight of a hulking figure standing in the road, partially obscured by shadows. It looked impossibly tall, its silhouette distorted, almost wrong. Before I could react, it darted out of sight. Panicked, I slammed on the accelerator, the cruiser lurching forward. I swerved back and forth, scanning the roadside, but the creature had vanished as if into thin air. Back at the station, I reported what I'd seen, my voice hoarse. Thompson looked at me with a mixture of pity and exasperation. Dismissed it as stress, hallucinations brought on by too much caffeine and the haunting images of Watkins' cabin. But I knew what I saw. The creature was out there, biding its time, playing with me like a cat with a cornered mouse. A few nights later, it came for the town. Power cut out all at once, plunging Willow Springs into darkness. Screams echoed down the main street, followed by the sound of shattering glass and splintering wood. Instinctively, I grabbed my shotgun and flashlight, heart pounding, and ran towards the chaos. Illuminating the main street with my flashlight beam, I saw a scene of mass panic. People were fleeing in terror, some bleeding, some wailing hysterically. Storefronts were smashed in, their contents strewn across the street. And everywhere, 
that same putrid stench clawing at my nostrils. In the flickering light, I caught a glimpse of the creature, a hulking form at the edge of the darkness, its eyes gleaming a malevolent yellow. It was crouched low, half hidden in the shadows, almost blending into the night, as if the darkness itself had given it monstrous form. Just as quickly as it appeared, it vanished again, leaving behind only the lingering terror hanging in the air. I aimed my shotgun into the darkness and fired, more out of a desperate need to act than any hope of hitting the thing. The blast echoed into the night, momentarily shattering the terrified silence. Chaos reigned for what felt like an eternity. Cries of the injured, shouts of fear, and the echoing blasts of shotguns filled the night air as myself and a few other deputies tried desperately to establish some semblance of order. Thompson, finally shaken from his stubborn denial, was barking orders and coordinating efforts to evacuate civilians to the safety of the fortified town hall. As the first rays of dawn painted the horizon, the creature seemed to withdraw, the attacks tapering off. We cautiously emerged from whatever cover we'd taken, surveying the destruction with grim determination. Main Street looked like a war zone. The general store was half demolished. Watkins' truck was found overturned and mangled at the edge of town, and the scent of blood, both animal and disturbingly human, hung heavy in the air. We found poor Jenkins, one of our own, lying in a shadowed alley. The sight, it still haunts my nightmares. I won't describe it here, just know that whatever did that wasn't an animal, not simply a force of nature. There was a calculated cruelty to it. The aftermath was a whirlwind of horror and confusion. State troopers and even a few National Guard units rolled in after frantic calls from Thompson finally pierced the veil of disbelief at the higher levels. News crews descended upon our small town, the world given a glimpse into our living nightmare. Makeshift morgues overflowed, and the once quiet desert nights were filled with the constant sound of helicopters and search parties combing the hills. The official explanation was unprecedented wild animal attacks, a freak occurrence driven by some unknown environmental factor. Lies meant to appease the panicked masses and prevent the town from collapsing in on itself. But those of us who had seen the creature, witnessed its unnatural cunning, knew the truth. Thompson, to his credit, swallowed his pride and assembled us, myself, a few seasoned deputies, and a motley crew of volunteers ranging from old-school hunters to tech-savvy outdoorsmen. We unofficially called ourselves the Night Watch. Our mission was clear, even if it sounded crazy to anyone outside our grim circle. Hunt the Skinwalker. End it. We spent months scouring the desert and surrounding mountains. Using a mix of old-fashioned tracking skills and cutting-edge surveillance equipment borrowed from the guard, we sought not only signs of the creature, but evidence— something the outside world would have to acknowledge. We found tracks, massive footprints no known animal could leave. We found abandoned camps ravaged in the same manner as Watkins' cabin. And most horrifically, we found bodies bearing those same monstrous claw marks, drained of blood, sometimes, sometimes with chunks missing. It was as though the creature wasn't just killing, but feeding. The images still sear themselves into my mind on sleepless nights. We also found something else. Rumors, whispers in nearby Native American reservations, stories passed down through generations. They spoke of the skinwalker using similar terms to the Pioneer Journal. But there were also hints of ways to fight back, rituals and weapons steeped in lore we didn't fully understand. One moonless night, Driven by a mix of desperation and a burning need for vengeance, we staked out a desolate stretch of canyon land. Legend said skinwalkers favored such places. Thompson, 
Ever the pragmatists set up traps with motion detectors and night vision cameras. Old Man Whitaker, descended from a long line of tribal elders, performed a protection ritual that made my hair stand on end. It involved chanting, burning herbs, and marking us with a pungent mixture he swore would mask our scent from evil spirits. It seemed insane, even to me, but at that point we'd long ago passed logic and barreled headfirst into the realm of the unknown. The waiting game was nerve-wracking, the silence broken only by the desert wind and the occasional rustling of some unseen nocturnal creature. Hours stretched into an eternity. And then it happened. One of the motion detectors triggered, and there it was. The camera feed grainy and bathed in an eerie green glow, showed the creature prowling the edge of our trap. It was even bigger than I remembered, its emaciated form rippling with unnatural muscles under its patchy, mange-ridden fur. Those eyes, they burned straight through the camera lens, seeming to pierce directly into my soul. We opened fire, a cacophony of gunfire echoing through the canyon. It roared, a soul-shaking sound that reverberated through the rocks. The creature was fast, dodging our bullets with impossible agility, but we landed some hits. I distinctly heard the sickening thud of my shotgun blast making contact, saw it stumble. And then, with an ear-splitting shriek, it vanished, leaping into the shadows with a speed that defied nature. Wounded, maybe, but not dead. We scrambled to the spot where it had stood, following a trail of dark blood that disappeared into a narrow crevice in the canyon wall. We didn't pursue it. Something about that shadowed crevice made even the bravest among us hesitate. Thompson, for all his newfound belief in the monstrous, declared it was too dangerous, and the guard commander, suddenly confronted with very real evidence of the creature, backed him up. The aftermath is a blur. Official reports shifted from animal attacks to a possible deranged cult, the evidence covered up or twisted to fit a more palatable narrative. Those of us in the night watch know better. We keep a vigil, unofficial and unsung. Patrols still venture into the desert, shotguns loaded, eyes scanning the shadows. Whitaker still performs his rituals, and a faint trace of that herb mixture lingers on my uniform. The skinwalker is still out there, I know it. Wounded lurking, maybe even plotting its revenge. Sometimes, on the stillest of nights, I imagine I can hear its ragged breathing carried on the desert wind, smell the foul stench of its presence. And out on the horizon, a flicker of malevolent yellow eyes glowing in the unending darkness. My name is Rowan Hayes, and this happened to me on February 16, 2012. Most folks think working for the Park Service means handing out maps, maybe chasing off the occasional drunk camper. Turns out, reality's got more teeth. I was tracking a spike in bear complaints in Yellowstone, figuring some idiot tourist left a cooler out. What I found, well, it changed everything. Now, I'm not the kind to believe in Bigfoot and UFOs, right? But the reports got weird. Half-eaten deer, tracks bigger than any grizzly, and this smell witnesses described as rotten eggs mixed with wet fur. Something was out there, something big, and it wasn't playing by the rules. My supervisor thought I was nuts when I requested reinforcements and specialized gear. Washington, in their infinite wisdom, sent me Dr. Whitaker, a biologist with zero field experience, soft as a marshmallow, and smelling way too strongly of fancy cologne. Whatever. My job was to keep him alive and get answers. We tracked the thing for days. Broken branches led us off the marked trails, deeper into the thick forest where even the sunlight seemed afraid to tread. 
I found the carcass first. A full-grown elk, not eaten, but ripped apart like a chew toy. Torn flesh, shattered bones, and blood sprayed across the trees like some kind of twisted Jackson Pollock painting. Whitaker turned pale, stammering out something about undocumented predator behavior. He was still taking photos of the carnage when I heard it, a rustling from the tree line, followed by a low growl that set my teeth on edge. That's when it stepped out of the shadows. I'll try, but words fail. It was like a bear and a man got caught in a blender and came out, wrong. Massive, standing almost eight feet tall, covered in matted fur that stank of decay. Its eyes. Lord, the eyes were the worst. Yellow slits in a face stretched into a permanent, agonized scream. Whitaker shrieked, dropped his camera, and scrambled backward. My training kicked in. I yelled for Whitaker to run, raised my rifle, and squeezed the trigger. The shots cracked through the silent forest, and the creature staggered. I swore I saw tufts of fur fly, but it kept coming, roaring its fury. I fired again and again until my rifle clicked dry. The monster was close enough that I could smell its foul breath, see the individual strands of coarse hair on its arms. It lunged, a clawed hand the size of a trash can lid swiping at me. I ducked, the claws tearing through my backpack. Waker screamed again, but this time it was cut short. I spun, the half-empty pack a clumsy weapon in my hands, in time to see Waker disappear into the trees, the creature's hulking form close behind. Then silence. Only the echo of Whitaker's final scream the rustling leaves, and my ragged breaths. I called his name, my voice catching in my throat. No answer. I knew, deep down, there wouldn't be. I reported the incident, the attack, Whitaker's death. Park Security, FBI, the whole alphabet soup descended on Yellowstone. They found the shredded remains of my pack, traces of blood, not a single sign of Whitaker or the creature. My story got me labeled unreliable, shuffled to a desk job. Folks say I was lucky. Maybe they're right. But at night, I see those yellow eyes, hear the crunch of bone in Whitaker's scream. And I know damn well, lucky, isn't the word I'd use. The file on the Yellowstone incident is sealed tighter than a drum. They wrote it off as an animal attack, maybe a rogue grizzly. Me? I know what I saw. It wasn't natural, wasn't supposed to exist. And someplace, deep in those woods, I bet it's still out there, waiting. Sometimes, I dream about going back, hunting it down. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe it's the only way to make the nightmare stop. My name is Caden Price, and this happened to me on November 28, 1991, two days after Thanksgiving. I remember because, growing up, my favorite day of the year wasn't Christmas or my birthday. It was the day after Thanksgiving. Leftovers galore and everyone all tuckered out. I got to have the house to myself on that day and play my Atari. I'm not in video games anymore, never have been for the last thirty years. These days, I hunt things that should only exist in nightmares, things that people tell campfire stories about. See, about thirty years back, something changed my trajectory. I work for a branch of the government that most people think is a myth. I don't blame them, we're good at keeping secrets. It was a Thursday morning that started like any other. We got a briefing from our team lead, Agent Vance. This one was different, though. It wasn't some grainy Bigfoot footage or a report of a werewolf sighting. This time, Vance seemed on edge, and his usual stoicism was cracked wide open. 
We've had multiple reports come in over the last few months. People vanishing near Pike National Forest in Colorado, Vance said, tossing a file onto the table. He gestured for us to take a look, but I kept my hands folded in my lap. I'd learned the hard way. If Vance wanted you to touch something, he'd tell you directly. My partner, Rowan, didn't have the same restraint. He snatched the file and flipped it open, then swore out loud. I shot him a glare. Vance wasn't fond of outbursts. Rowan's eyes skimmed the documents, and his face went pale. What the hell are we dealing with? He muttered, just loudly enough for Vance to hear. We don't know, Vance admitted. The reports are unusual. That was an understatement. I finally leaned forward and lifted a single photo from the file. It showed what was left of a campsite, torn to shreds. The canvas of the tent was practically flayed open, and sleeping bags were ripped apart, feathers trailing in the wind. But the most chilling thing wasn't the damage, it was the blood. Thick, dark smears of it covered everything. Is this a bear attack? I asked, dropping the photo. I'd seen what bears could do, and while it was gruesome, this scene looked different, more intentional. Vance shook his head. Witnesses said they saw something big in the trees. Tall. Walked on two legs, but not like a man. I glanced at Rowan. He was ashen-faced, staring at the photo in his hands as if it might start moving. We'd seen a lot of things in our line of work but this felt different. There was a creeping dread seeping into my bones. Vance pulled out a map and pinned it to the wall. This area outside of Woodland Park has the most concentrated reports. Thick forest, lots of places for something to hide. We're sending you in to gather intel. No engagement unless absolutely necessary. And if it is necessary? Rowan asked his voice shaky. Do what you have to do to survive. You leave tomorrow at dawn. Vance dismissed us with a wave of his hand. No goodbyes, no words of encouragement, just a chilling reminder of what we were up against. We spent the rest of the day prepping. Standard gear, high-powered rifles, ammo, night vision, the works. But this time... We also added silver rounds. Vance had dropped hints over the years, enough to make me think that sometimes the old legends were rooted in something real. The drive out to Colorado was tense. Rowan didn't try to break the uneasy silence. Frankly, I didn't either. The air crackled with a nervous energy we both tried to ignore. We set up camp well away from the designated hot spot a precaution that Vance always insisted upon. First nights in a new area were all about observation. We spent the next several hours scanning the forest edge, taking turns on watch. The woods, typically alive with the sounds of nocturnal creatures, were eerily quiet. Not even an owl hooted, and the forest floor lay undisturbed. Something wasn't right. Even the air felt heavy, charged with a static hum that set my teeth on edge. As nightfall draped the forest in shadow, Rowan broke the unsettling silence. You think, you think it's watching us? Out there? I shifted, eyes locked on the tree line. I wouldn't rule it out. I lowered my voice. Whatever's been snatching people, it's smart. Maybe it saw us set up camp. Rowan shivered and drew his rifle closer. We waited, nerves taut. Time seemed to stretch impossibly thin, each rustle of leaves an echo of monstrous footsteps. Eventually, exhaustion set in, forcing even adrenaline to surrender. We agreed to short shifts of sleep, one awake, one with eyes closed. Rowan took the first watch, and I curled up in my sleeping bag my brain refusing to shut down. Every creak of a branch, every whisper of the wind, 
had me bolting upright. Images of the ravaged campsite flickered behind my eyelids. I thought about the missing people, snatched into the night, and my stomach churned. When my turn came, the moon had begun to rise, casting long, wavering shadows across the forest floor. My gaze raked the tree line, picking out shapes that could be anything or nothing at all. I swore every other minute I saw a hulking silhouette flicker into the darkness between the trees. Was it my imagination, amped up by fear, or something more? Just as I was about to blink away the illusion, a scream tore through the night. Rowan! I scrambled to my feet. My heart was a frantic drumbeat. Rowan! A choked gurgle was the only answer. I sprinted towards the sound, branches whipping at my face. And then I saw him, or at least what was left of him. His body lay twisted at the base of a tree, shredded clothes soaked in blood. His eyes were wide and vacant, staring at the sky. It was an image burned into my memory forever. Something roared. Deep. Guttural. I swung my rifle around, but the darkness closed in. I unleashed a volley of bullets, the muzzle flash momentarily illuminating the forest. The shots echoed through the night, but if they hit anything, I couldn't tell. The roar was replaced by heavy footsteps crashing away into the woods. I stumbled over to Rowan, tears of rage and grief scorching my eyes. It should have been me. Why him? Fury pulsed through me, fueling a desperate need for vengeance. It didn't matter what I was up against anymore. I loaded a fresh clip and charged into the darkness, following the fading echoes of those monstrous footsteps. I tracked it through the thick undergrowth, my breaths ragged and harsh. Branches tore at my skin, and I stumbled over roots, but I didn't care. I focused on one thing, making it pay. Then I saw it. Ahead, a clearing loomed. Moonlight slashed through the trees, casting an eerie glow on a hulking form in the center. The creature dwarfed any bear I'd ever seen, its shoulders impossibly broad. Coarse black fur clung to its powerful limbs, ending in long, gleaming claws. It turned and in that moonlit second I saw its face. It was twisted in a chilling mockery of a man, its eyes glowing like yellow embers. It snarled, revealing a maw of razor-sharp teeth. Pure rage propelled me forward. I fired, aiming for the monstrous heart within that hulking chest. Silver rounds pierced its flesh, and it howled in pain. But it wasn't enough. It charged, a whirlwind of monstrous fury. I managed a single desperate shot before it slammed into me, sending my rifle flying from my hands. The impact knocked the breath from my body. Claws raked across my chest, tearing deep gouges. I screamed, more from raw fury than pain, and struggled against the creature's crushing weight. Its fetid breath washed over me in hot waves. I was fading fast. Spots danced before my eyes, and darkness closed in. Yet, through the haze, I managed a final act of defiance. I fumbled for my backup pistol, jammed it against the creature's hide, and squeezed the trigger. The shot reverberated. The creature jerked and then went still, its crushing weight abruptly lifting. I gasped, sucking in lungfuls of air and shoved the creature's lifeless body off me. My limbs trembled, and my vision swam. I lay there, staring up at the starry sky, every breath a painful rasp. Somewhere in the distance, sirens wailed, growing closer with each passing minute. Rescue was coming, maybe. I didn't care if they made it in time. I'd won. Sort of. But the cost... I closed my eyes, images of Rowan's broken body flashing across my mind. We hadn't just lost an agent, we'd lost a friend. 
The paramedics reached me, their urgent voices a distant hum as they patched me up. I was loaded into an ambulance, the lights a blur streaking through the night. At the hospital, the questions started, relentless and invasive. I lied. I told them a bear had attacked us. It was the standard cover story, believable enough for the public but flimsy enough for those in the know to see through. Vance arrived a few days later with a single raised eyebrow and a file in his hand. No surprise there. He was damn good at his job. You're lucky as hell to be alive, Price, he said, his voice gruff but laced with an undercurrent of concern. He dropped the file on my bed. It was a thick one, full of reports, autopsies, photos. Everything the government could dig up on those missing persons. I didn't open it then, didn't have the stomach for it. Vance did impress me. Instead, he offered me a choice. Walk away, early retirement with a full pension and enough NDAs to wallpaper a house. Or come back, dive headfirst into the shadows. I took it. Of course, I did. What else was there? I couldn't go back to a normal life after this. Not after I had stared into the abyss, and it had stared right back. The months that followed were a blur of rehab and debriefings. Vance assembled a new team, hand-picked and thrown into the deep end. We went on missions, tracked werewolves across the southwest, hunted a lake monster in Michigan, even went toe-to-toe -to -toe with something I can only describe as a living shadow in the heart of New York City. Each time, we skirted disaster. Each time, we paid in blood. The faces of the fallen, my fallen comrades, haunted me. Rowan. Ramirez. Jensen. All of them gone because of things that should exist only in nightmares. I started drinking. Heavily. Blackouts became my escape, blessed hours where the monsters faded for a while. And then came the nightmares. Vivid. Horrifying. Not of the creatures I hunted, but of the creature in the Colorado forest. Its yellow eyes, its mocking grin, the way its claws had shredded my flesh. I'd wake up screaming, soaked in sweat, the image of its monstrous face seared into my brain. My apartment became a battlefield of empty bottles and scattered case files, a twisted reflection of the wreckage inside me. One morning... After a particularly bad night, I looked in the mirror and didn't recognize the hollow-eyed stranger staring back at me. I'd become the thing I hunted, a monster fueled by grief and rage. It was time for a change, or what was left of me would be swallowed whole. I called Vance the next day. I'm done, I told him. My voice sounded rusty, unused to speaking for so long. You sure about that, Price? There was the slightest hint of disappointment in his tone. Yeah. I'm sure. This time, there was no offer to come back, no promises of better days. I didn't expect them. It wasn't that kind of world. I hung up, leaving behind a life of shadows and secrets. But the past refused to release its grip. Nightmares still plagued me, and some days I swore I could feel the chilling weight of that creature's gaze upon me. I moved frequently, never staying in one place too long. It was a pitiable existence, always looking over my shoulder, forever haunted by the things I'd seen, the things I'd done. I didn't find peace, not really. Maybe no one does after a life like mine but I found a kind of silence. A lonely, hollow silence, punctuated by the distant echoes of those monstrous roars and the fading screams of my lost comrades. It's a heavy burden to carry, but it's mine. I parked my truck by the edge of the woods near Old Pine Lake, 
about an hour outside of Cedar Point. Me, Brecken, and Lane Shaw were geared up for some night fishing. Okay, maybe night drinking with a side of fishing. Lane Shaw swears this place is full of giant crappy, but honestly, I just needed a break from the city grind. We found a nice sandy spot under the big oak tree and started unloading our stuff. It was already pitch black when we got there. Not a star in sight and that lake was dead calm. No bugs, no wind, absolutely nothing moving, kind of eerie. But I wasn't gonna let that ruin the vibe. Damn, Nesha, where'd you hear about this little slice of paradise? Brecken cracked open a beer and grinned. My cousin used to sneak out here back in the day. She shrugged, baiting her hook. Said it ain't no regular lake. Before I could ask what she meant, something massive broke the surface of the water maybe thirty feet out. Not a splash, mind you, but a ripple that spread out slow and smooth, like a stone skipping a thousand times. Holy crap, was that a fish? Brecken stumbled a little, beard dribbling down his chin. I don't think. I mean, what the hell else could it be? I stared out at the water heart pounding. Could have been a turtle, I guess. A big one. Lane Shaw didn't say nothing, just tossed out her line. Probably nothing, chill. We settled into it, kind of jumpy. Each time a branch cracked or something moved in the underbrush, we jerk our heads up, eyes wide. That weird feeling of being watched started to settle over me. A couple of hours later, we hadn't caught squat, but I was buzzing pretty good off the beers. When you work construction and wake up at the crack of dawn every day, a little nightcap goes a long way. I started telling some wild stories from back in high school that always get Brecken going. That's when the reeds started to move. Not like rustling in the wind, but swaying, deliberate, like something was pushing its way through. We froze. Lane Shaw turned pale, and I couldn't even crack a joke. Then we heard it. A low, almost guttural moan, right from the reeds. It wasn't an animal, at least none that I'd ever heard of. Then the reeds parted. Standing there, maybe twice the height of any man I'd ever seen, was a thing. It was hunched over, limbs all gangly and thin, too long to be right. The head was like a stag skull, all bone and antler, but warped somehow, stretched long. Two tiny, glowing pinpricks were where the eyes should be, and it just stared right at us. We gotta get out of here, Brecken whispered, his voice cracked with fear. No kidding, I muttered, already fumbling for my keys in my pocket. Lane Shaw, though, wasn't moving. Wait, she breathed. Nesha, are you crazy? I hissed, but she held up a hand, eyes still fixed on the creature. It tilted its head, and another of those moans rumbled out. Almost inquisitive? It took a shuffling step forward, and something glinted in the faint moonlight. In its long, skeletal hand, it was holding. Brecken's fishing rod the one that had toppled in earlier when we'd stumbled around after that weird ripple. I glanced at Brecken, who looked about ready to faint. It wants to give this back? Lane Shaw sounded baffled, but not scared anymore. The creature extended the rod a little further, tilting its head again. Oh my God, this ain't happening, Brecken whimpered, clutching at my arm. I looked at Lane Shaw, then back at the creature. I swear my gut told me to do it. Slowly, I reached out, our eyes locked. The rod was cold, slimy where it had been in the water. As I took it, the creature lowered its hand, then gave a kind of jerky bow. Without another word, it turned and melted back into the reeds. The sound slowly faded, and then, just silence again. So, uh, you catch anything? Brecken's voice was barely above a whisper. 
I looked down at the fishing rod in my hands. Nope. Not a damn thing, I said, trying to laugh, but the sound came out shaky. Come on, Lane Shaw said, already packing up her stuff. Let's get out of here. My cousin never mentioned nothing about no. Whatever that was. Half stumbling in the dark, we loaded everything back into the truck and hightailed it out of those woods. We didn't speak the whole drive back, not a word. And in all these months since, none of us have brought it up. Like, what can you even say about something like that? Sometimes, though, late at night, I get this nagging feeling we weren't supposed to leave Old Pine Lake that night. Like we were part of something, bigger than catching some stupid crappy. And who knows, maybe that ain't the last we'll see of that creature. Maybe someday. I live on the outskirts of Pine Mills, Georgia. Population barely over 600, and half of that seems to be the folks at the retirement home. It's a quiet town, the type where the local feed mill closing down is considered major news. Been here my whole life, just like my mama and her parents before her. My friends, Elston and Briar, always joke that my family planted the first pine tree this town's named after. I usually just laughed and went on with whatever we were doing at the time. The three of us always hung out. Our folks knew each other for ages, and we were born within a couple of weeks of each other. Our moms sometimes joked about which of us would marry who first. It wasn't like that, though. We were just good buddies. The type that could hang out all day, fishing on Briar's granddad's pond or just hanging by the old train tracks without needing to say much. It was October of last year, a few weeks shy of my twenty-sixth birthday. Nothing much to celebrate. No big job. No girlfriend, still living with my mama to help take care of her. But hey, at least I had my buddies. I remember Briar's grandpa had passed away recently, and we were planning to take a trip out to the old man's property outside of town. Briar told us his folks were gonna be cleaning up, sorting through belongings and such, and he needed some help going through his granddad's workshop. That Saturday rolled around, gray and drizzly. I piled into my beat-up truck and swung by Briar's place to pick him up. Elston, ever punctual, was already there, a travel mug steaming in his hand. We gave Briar some good-natured ribbing for being late to his own cleanup. Elston hopped in the back. Briar was quiet on the drive, which was kinda unusual. But we figured the whole grandpa thing had him down. We didn't say much, just kept the radio low and gave him some space. About half an hour out of town, Elston piped up from the back. Geez, how much further is this place, Briar? Feels like a whole different county out here. Briar chuckled. Yeah, man, it's way the heck out there. Grandad wanted his peace and quiet. About ten more minutes on a bumpy dirt road and we pulled up to what had to be the property. There was a small farmhouse, weathered and white, with an overgrown yard around it. Behind it, a big rusty old barn leaned at a worrying angle. Briar stepped out and stretched, and we followed suit. You boys ready to do some heavy lifting? he asked, giving us a crooked grin. Elston just groaned and said, Dude, you owe us so many beers. We walked a loop around the barn, trying to figure out how to get inside without the whole thing toppling over. Briar pointed to a half-rotted door hanging on a single hinge. Grandad wasn't the handiest man, he said with a sigh. We figured that would be our entrance. Inside, it was like something out of an old movie. Tools of all kinds hung on the walls, covered in dust and cobwebs. Shafts of weak sunlight pierced holes in the roof, 
and the musty smell made me cough. Okay, Briar. Where to start? I asked, rubbing my eyes. I felt a chill and wasn't sure if it was the damp air or just some weird feeling. Briar shrugged and wandered toward a workbench in the far corner. It was covered with half-finished projects, scraps of wood, and tools. I moved closer and started sorting through bits of metal and old screws. Elston was behind me, grumbling and muttering to himself. Suddenly, he shouted way too loud. Hey, what the hell is this? He held up what looked like a strip of dark, leathery hide. Briar came over, frowning. Don't know, put it back. His voice was a little sharper than usual. Elston shrugged and tossed it back on the bench. He kept sifting through some wood scraps. His usual light-heartedness dimmed a bit. After a bit, he said quietly, Place gives me the creeps, man. I kind of felt something similar, but chalked it up to the gloomy atmosphere. We kept sorting for a while, loading up boxes and sorting out tools. Elston kept glancing around the shadows, and I was starting to get a bit antsy myself. Hey, Briar. I started, but he cut me off. Hold up, I think I found something, he said, leaning closer to the bench. Check this out. In the corner, half hidden under some old newspapers, was a wooden box. Plain and weathered, with a tarnished metal latch. Briar reached out a hesitant hand, hesitated, then flipped it open. I moved in to get a better look. Inside wasn't anything special. Just a bundle of dirty, brittle papers wrapped in old twine. Briar lifted it out carefully, and we gathered around to see what it was. Dust flew up as he untied the twine, revealing a stack of papers filled with faded, spidery writing. Letters? Elston asked. But Briar was already frowning and scanning the top page. This doesn't look like Grandad's writing, he mumbled. Maybe some old mail? Or something your great-grandma wrote? I suggested. Briar didn't respond, just kept reading. His face went a shade paler, eyebrows drawn tight together. His hand started to tremble slightly as he flipped through the pages. Elston and I exchanged a nervous glance. It had to be more than just some old letters to cause this reaction. Finally, Briar looked up. His eyes were wide, a flicker of something like fear in them. We gotta get out of here, he breathed, voice barely above a whisper. He fumbled with the papers, shoving them back in the box, and haphazardly retied the twine. Whoa, Briar, hold on. What's the deal? I asked, trying to keep my voice calm. He shook his head, eyes darting around like a cornered animal. We've gotta go. Now. He turned and bolted towards the door, still clutching at the bundle of papers. Elston and I scrambled after him, confusion gnawing at my gut. I could hear Briar muttering something under his breath, but couldn't make out the words. We burst out of the barn, into the dreary gray daylight. Briar ran straight to his old pickup, fumbling with the keys. I glanced back at the barn a prickle of unease twisting my insides. Had something moved in the shadowy doorway? I shook my head, attributing it to my rising nerves. Come on, guys! Get in! Briar yelled, his voice tense. Elston and I hopped into the truck, and Briar gunned the engine. He peeled out of the property, tires kicking up dirt and gravel. None of us spoke, the silence heavy and oppressive. Briar looked straight ahead, his knuckles white where he gripped the steering wheel. After a while, Elston finally spoke. Briar, what's going on? Why'd we have to leave like that? Briar took a deep breath, still not taking his eyes off the road. Those papers. He hesitated, 
as if choosing his words carefully. They're not what I thought. Not Grandad's letters. They're something else. Silence settled again, broken only by the rumble of the truck. I shot Elston a worried look. I could tell he was as concerned as I was. Finally, Briar cleared his throat. Have you ever heard stories? About things that live in the deep woods? Not human, not like us. Elston scoffed. Come on, Briar. You talking old wives' tales? Ghosts and monsters? A flicker of anger crossed Briar's face. I'm serious. This town, there's history here. Stuff people don't talk about much. He hesitated. Look, those papers, they were journals. My granddad's, going back way before he was even born. It was like records of sightings, of something out there. A chill ran down my spine. Elston looked skeptical, but he wasn't saying anything now. Briar took a deep breath and pressed on. The descriptions, from decades ago, they sounded a whole lot like Dash. Before he could finish, Elston yelled. Look out! I slammed back against the seat as Briar swerved. In the middle of the road, just ahead of us, stood a figure. Not a human figure. Tall and gaunt, it hunched awkwardly on spindly legs that seemed too long for its body. The head was small and elongated, with skin stretched tight like old leather over the skull. The thing didn't even turn to face us. It just stood there, blocking the road, completely still. For a moment, time seemed to freeze. Then Briar recovered, flooring the accelerator and aiming the truck straight for that creature. My heart pounded a frantic rhythm against my ribs as the gas pedal hit the floor. The tires squealed in protest, and the old truck lurched forward. We were committed now, barreling straight towards that impossible creature. The thing still didn't move, maybe it didn't see us, or maybe it knew it had nowhere to run. Just as I thought we were going to hit it, the creature finally reacted. With a speed that sent chills down my spine, it leapt off the road and into the trees. The truck swerved, and for a moment I truly thought we were going to roll over. We skidded to a halt, dirt flying into the air. We sat in stunned silence for what felt like an eternity. Finally, Briar turned his head slowly towards us. His eyes were wild, his face pale enough to be made of bone. You saw that? Right. You both. His voice was barely a whisper. Elston and I nodded weakly, too shaken to speak. We were all thinking the same thing, what in the hell was that? Without a word, Briar turned the key and shifted back into gear. We took off down the road, the tension in the cab thick enough to choke us. We didn't speak, didn't dare to process what we had just seen. Finally, Briar pulled over to the side again and cut the engine. The silence descended again, broken only by our ragged breathing. After a few minutes, Briar turned to us, his voice steadier now. Okay, that was the thing from those papers. I know it. The way it moved, what it looked like. He trailed off, unable to finish the thought. We sat for what felt like hours, just staring out the windshield. We had to come up with a plan, but my mind was blank. What could we even do? Call the cops? Who the hell would believe us? I thought back to those papers, the faded writing describing creatures lurking in the shadows of these woods. This wasn't some urban legend. This was real. And it was dangerous. Elston spoke up first. Briar, where did you put those papers? Briar shook his head. I didn't take them. We can't have that here, not after. He didn't finish the sentence. Frustration flared up in me. Briar! Why the hell not? That's evidence. 
Briar's face hardened. No. That's the thing's history. They knew about it. The people who wrote that. They're all dead, Elston. Or missing, or worse. That journal it's cursed. And I won't bring that into my home. We argued for a while about the papers, but eventually, exhaustion took over. We decided our only option was to get back to town. It was a tense, silent drive. Briar never took his eyes off the road, and Elston and I kept glancing back, expecting the creature to appear at any moment. Finally, the familiar streets of Pine Mills came into view. For the first time in hours, I felt a sliver of relief. We were back in civilization. Maybe there would be safety among other people. Briar dropped Elston off at his place, promising we'd talk soon and figure things out. He then swung by my house, looking drawn and tired. He didn't go inside, just lingered in the truck with the engine idling. I should have listened to Grandad. He warned me about those woods. He never went out to that place after Grandma died. I didn't know what to say. There were too many questions, too much horror swirling in my head. Finally, exhaustion won out. I'm gonna get some sleep. We can talk more in the morning. I stepped out and headed towards the front door, my legs feeling like lead. That night, sleep was an elusive beast. I tossed and turned, the image of that creature burned into my mind. I knew, deep down, that my life had changed irrevocably. There were things hiding in the shadows, and we had seen them. The next morning, I waited for Briar's call, but it never came. After a few hours, worry gnawing at me, I decided to head over to his house. I figured he probably needed help cleaning out the rest of his granddad's things anyway. When I pulled up, something felt wrong. It took me a moment to realize what it was. Briar's truck was gone. My heart pounded in my chest as dread slowly seeped in. I tried calling him, but it went straight to voicemail. A horrible, sinking feeling settled in my stomach. I knocked on the door, but there was no answer. Against my better judgment, I tried the doorknob, and to my surprise it opened. As I cautiously stepped into the house, I called out for Briar. Silence echoed back at me. Panic began to rise in my throat as I moved from room to room, a growing sense of unease prickling at my skin. In the kitchen, I found the culprit. The back door stood slightly ajar, swinging gently. My stomach lurched. Briar wouldn't have just left without telling me. Especially not after yesterday. I inched my way toward the backyard, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. And there, on the ground, lay Briar's phone. Cracked and discarded. A shiver ran down my spine. In the distance I heard it. A rustling, a cracking of branches. My head whipped around, and through the trees I saw a movement. I knew that loping, inhuman gait. It was back. I didn't think, just ran. I sprinted across the yard, towards the tree line. Maybe if I could reach the road, I'd be safe. I heard it gaining on me, that awful clicking sound it made growing louder, closer. And then, I saw the road just ahead. With a final burst of speed, I stumbled out of the woods. I looked back, hoping I'd lost it. Too late. It was standing just on the other side of the trees, staring at me with those unnatural eyes. For a moment we stayed frozen, my ragged breaths loud in the silence. And then, the creature turned and disappeared back into the woods. I never saw Briar again. I like to think that the papers were wrong, that somehow he managed to escape whatever that creature was, something in the woods people call the rakeback. But deep down, I know the truth. The woods out near Pine Mills hold more than just trees and shadows. 
They hold secrets and ancient things that are better left undisturbed. This happened to me on July 4th, 2009. Funny how dates stick with you afterward. Not that it was a celebration. More like a fireworks show gone wrong. My name's Jonah Beckett, and the way I see it, the world is divided into two types of people, those hooked into the system and those cut loose. Fifteen years back, I cut the damn cord. My place is a little cabin, tucked into the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, one of those old forest service properties meant for rangers that never came. Took some backbreaking weeks to clear the overgrowth and make it livable. But the creek keeps water flowing, sun hits the solar panels, and the woods are full of critters if you know how to look. Not the lifestyle for everyone, I get that, but cities felt like those ant farms. All that meaningless bustle. I needed quiet. The first few years were, well, lonely doesn't quite cover it. Then I met Rose, in of all places, the dinky town of Mariposa. She'd inherited her grandma's place at the edge of town, and we fell for each other, hard. Rose, she was one of them. Liked her creature comforts, the cable TV, the dinners out. Didn't last too long. City girl and mountain man, you can guess the rest. But it hit me hard. Probably why I've never bothered trying to connect with anyone since. Morning of the 4th, I was splitting wood for the fire pit. Figured I'd grill up some steaks later, maybe open a beer despite the early hour. I found it halfway up the ridge behind the cabin. Can't say exactly what made me take a detour from my usual route. Maybe a flicker of color, maybe just my feed not wanting to do the same damn thing again. The deer carcass hung from a tree branch, legs roped together. At first, I thought it might be some poacher's stash. Then I got closer. It wasn't a clean kill. The whole torso was twisted open, ribs splayed like a broken fan. Fur hung in ragged clumps, and the smell hit me like a fist to the gut. That's when I felt the first prickle of unease. No predator I knew would do something like this. I backed away slowly, eyes scanning the trees. That uneasy feeling turned to something sharper a moment later. A single, glistening drop landed on my arm, then another. Looking up, I saw the antlered skull of the deer, gleaming red and wet, hanging a good four feet above where the body had been. The rest of that day passed in a blur. I locked down the cabin, more from instinct than logic. Didn't touch the steak or beer. Just sat and watched the shadows lengthen with a knot in my stomach. When night fell, I didn't even start a fire. Figured light wouldn't help. Rose was a chatterbox. Hell, half the reason she didn't get the mountain life was she couldn't stand the silence. Me, I was starting to find benefits in it. At least you were more likely to hear things coming. It started with a snap, like a thick branch giving way. I jolted upright on the couch, old shotgun from my grandpa in my lap. The goats bleated, panicked, from down by the creek. Then another sound, this one from up on the ridge. A low, guttural growl that turned my blood to ice. I waited, barely breathing. It sounded big. Bigger than any bear or cougar I'd ever heard of. Another growl, closer this time, and the scrabbling of claws against rock. That's when the screaming started. One of the goats, its cry choked off abruptly. The shotgun felt pathetically small in my hands. Whatever was out there, I sure as hell didn't want to get a good look at it. I crept to the window, just a peek. The moon cast long, distorted shadows through the pines. I saw a shape, huge, hunched, moving with unnatural speed. 
it disappeared into the trees with my other goat slung over its back. My mind raced. Head into town, raise a fuss? But who'd believe me? Some crazy hermit seeing monsters in the night? Besides, by the time anyone got up here, whatever it was would be long gone. I spent the rest of that night barricaded in the cabin, gun loaded, a cold sweat soaking through my shirt. As the dawn crept through the cracks in the shutters, the sounds finally faded away. The next morning, I ventured out. There was blood, patches of fur, and deep gouges marking the tree trunks on the ridge. I followed the faint trail as best I could. It led up higher into the mountains, where even the logging roads didn't reach. Eventually, I came upon a cave, the entrance half obscured by pines. The hair on my neck prickled. Whatever monstrous thing had done this, it lived in there. Part of me, a small, stupid part, wanted to get a better look. Throw a rock at the entrance, try to draw it out. The same part of me, the part that liked not being torn open like my poor goats, won out. I got the hell out of there. For weeks, I barely slept. Every rustle of leaves, every night critter's call, sent me scrambling for the shotgun. The folks in Mariposa must have taken me for a real lunatic. I stopped going into town for supplies, hunkering down, living off the food I'd stored. I started making plans. Selling this place, finding a different patch of woods, maybe somewhere out east. Somewhere without that thing. Then came the Thompsons. A family from L.A., looking for their perfect summer vacation cabin. When they rolled up in their shiny SUV, grinning like they owned the whole damn wilderness, I saw myself as they must, unwashed, scraggly, eyes ringed with exhaustion. They wouldn't have listened to my warnings even if I tried. In the end, I took their money. Didn't even say goodbye. I heard about them later, of course. Missing persons report, search parties combing the hills. They never found anything, not one single trace. That thing, whatever it is, is smart. It knows how to hide, how to cover its tracks. The whispers around town started. Cougar attack, wild dog pack, even someone muttering about Bigfoot. No one suspected the truth, not the real terror that lurks out there. Fifteen years on, I live in a different patch of woods entirely. Small trailer park on the outskirts of a nowhere town in Wyoming. Got neighbors, the noisy kind. Power line runs right overhead, and the highway's never far out of earshot. I sleep better at night, I will admit that much. Don't jump every time a branch snaps in the dark. But I still dream about those twisted trees. I still hear the growling echo in the quiet moments. And sometimes, I swear, when I close my eyes and breathe in deep, I catch a whiff of something foul and rotten hanging on the wind. Folks say the mountains are haunted by ghosts. They're not far wrong. But some monsters ain't spirits. They walk the earth, they cast shadows, and if you cross their path, well, your name might just wind up another whisper lost in those deep, dark woods. They say it preys on livestock now. The ranchers are in an uproar, offering bounties, the whole nine yards. Some part of me wants to tell them to save their bullets. That thing, it ain't your normal predator. Makes the grizzlies look like house cats. Maybe they'll catch it, kill it. Maybe. Out there in the high country it roams, and I'll bet its belly is always full. They call it the devil elk. They wouldn't if they knew. It happened a few years back, on a trip down south. Not much of a vacation guy, Mora. Stay home and do some yard work. Type, 
but sometimes, well, life throws you unexpected curveballs. My sister, she was getting married, and seeing as she's my only sibling, I figured showing up was non-negotiable. Name's Griffin, by the way. Destination, Everglades City, right on the edge of the swamp. Place felt different to a guy used to the plains, thick humid air like a blanket, and a soundscape of buzzing bugs that seemed to get louder at night. The wedding was nice enough, outdoors under those big moss-covered trees, the bride of vision in white. But the whole nature thing, not really my scene. Next day, a bunch of us decided to rent a boat, do a little sightseeing before we all scattered back to our usual lives. My brother-in-law, Drake, he had all these grand plans for exploring the waterways, said it was the only way to see the real Everglades. Seemed like a lot of hassle, but everyone else was all hyped, so I shrugged and went along for the ride. We set off, the airboat buzzing through the water, cutting through the tall grass. It was peaceful in a way, the sun high overhead and the breeze against my face. But there was something about it, a sort of lurking stillness under the noise, like the swamp was holding its breath, watching us. Drake kept taking us deeper into a maze of smaller channels. Folks were getting restless, saying we should turn back. But then, with a triumphant grin, Drake cut the engine and pointed. Up ahead was a clearing, an old ramshackle shack built on stilts rising right out of the water. Legend has it, an old hermit used to live out here, he said. Folks say he vanished years ago, but the place is still standing. Now, that sparked some interest, the allure of a little mystery. We approached cautiously, tying the boat off to a weathered post and climbing the rickety wooden stairs to the porch. Inside, it was dark and dusty, filled with a jumble of old fishing gear and some unidentifiable junk. It was while I was poking around at the back of the shack that it started, a noise like a twig snapping. We all froze, listening. Then, from the shadowed corner, came a growl, low and rough, like nothing I'd ever heard before. Then it stepped into the light filtering in through the doorway. A towering, impossibly thin figure, its skin stretched tight over bone. The head was small, the jaw jutting out wide in a way that wasn't human. And the eyes, empty pits of darkness, devoid of anything but hunger. It let out a screech, high-pitched and chilling, then lunged. Chaos erupted, people screamed, shoving each other in a panic. Drake stumbled, fell through the rotten floorboards and disappeared with a splash into the swamp water. I didn't see him come back up. In the blind scramble back to the boat, my sister tripped, and that thing. I won't go into detail. Just know there was a lot of blood, and her screams turned into a gurgling sound before they cut off entirely. Someone grabbed my arm, my brother-in-law's dad, Harvey, pulling me towards the boat. He shoved me inside, cut the ropes with a hunting knife, then spun around, a pistol in his hand. He started shooting at the thing as it stalked along the shoreline, its movements jerky and unnatural. I didn't know if the bullets were even doing any good. Harvey turned, his eyes wild, yelled at me to get the engine going. I fumbled with the controls, hands shaking, and finally got the thing sputtering to life. The creature was closing the gap between us and the boat. And then Harvey, he did something I'll never forget. He leaped into the water, right in its path, and yelled, Go! Go, damn it! It snatched him up, his screams echoing across the swamp, and I gunned the engine, shooting off through the channels, the cries fading behind us. We didn't stop till we reached civilization. Told the park rangers what happened, but they just looked at each other, those grim expressions folks get when they think you're crazy or lying. The official story was a boating accident, animal attack maybe. 
My brother-in-law's family buried what was left of him and my sister and went back to their lives. Not me. That thing out there took a piece of me, left me with a hollowness inside. The nightmares aren't so frequent these days, but they linger. The image of those black eyes and that insatiable, gaping maw seared into my brain. I get jumpy around loud noises, avoid big bodies of water like the plague. Moved up north afterwards, craving open space and solid ground. Found a small town tucked away in the foothills of a mountain range. It's quiet here, peaceful in a way the swamp never was. The mountains, they feel sturdy, ancient, untouched by whatever evil lurks out there. But some nights, lying in the dark, I swear I can smell that rot, that foul swamp stench, drifting back to me even here. And a chill settles over me, a prickle of unease that says nowhere is truly safe. I know, deep down, that it's out there still, lurking in those hidden corners of the Everglades. They say some legends have teeth, and those old stories about a spirit of starvation, a wendigo haunting the swamps, well, those don't seem like just stories anymore. Sometimes, in the fading light, I catch a flicker at the edge of the tree line, a long, emaciated figure melting back into the shadows. And in those moments, there's a terrible certainty that washes over me. The swamp never truly let me go. I've traded one wilderness for another, but out there, the hunger roams eternal. I'll always be looking over my shoulder, forever haunted by the knowledge that some shadows stretch too long, and some hungers can never be satisfied. I was driving my big rig through a remote area in Utah, just enjoying the long stretches of open road. My name's Mackenzie Hadley, by the way. I'm a truck driver, and I've been doing this for quite some time. You could say it's in my blood. The beauty of this line of work is that it gives me plenty of time to think and take in all that America has to offer. As I was making my way around one winding curve, I happened upon an unusual scene. A car was off the road with its hazards flashing. A guy was leaning over the hood, trying to jumpstart his vehicle. I don't usually stop. You never know what you're getting into. But something about this guy seemed different so I pulled over. What seems to be the problem? I called out as I approached. The man glanced up at me. He appeared to be in his late forties with rough-looking flesh that seemed distinctly unlike the others around him. But he wore a pleasant smile, devoid of menace. Just some engine trouble, he replied. I can't seem to get this thing to turn over. I looked down at his dirty hands under the hood like a seasoned mechanic trying to reckon with a stubborn patient. He seemed to know what he was doing, but Lady Luck had not favored him yet. Well, I'm no expert, but would you like me to give it a try? I asked him casually. In response, he stepped back and gestured toward the engine with an affable grin plastered on his face. Be my guest. So I tried my hand at fixing his engine for a while, joking about how happy he'd be if we could get a running again so that he'd stop holding up traffic. A humorous exaggeration since there were hardly any other cars on this stretch of road. The man laughed heartily at my joke, and we continued working together in relative silence. However, while I was poking around in the car's innards, I noticed a few drops of something dark and sticky on the ground. It looked like blood. Hey, I said hesitantly, pointing to the red-tinged spot on the ground. Do you know what that is? The man stared at it for a moment before shaking his head in confusion. Beats me, he muttered strangely. Could be oil mixed with dirt, I suppose. Then suddenly, the engine sputtered to life under our ministrations. The man slapped me on the back in gratitude and slipped into the driver's seat as I backed away from his reviving vehicle. Thanks for all your help, 
He called out and drove off without another word. After the mechanic drove off, I couldn't help but feel unsettled by the blood-like substance I had spotted earlier. Despite this, I decided to continue on my way. As I walked down the road, I began to notice more and more of these dark, sticky drops. The further I went, the more frequent the spots seemed to become. A feeling of unease crept over me as I considered turning back. But curiosity urged me forward to see where this trail led. Eventually, it brought me to a small house on the outskirts of town. The drops seemed to lead directly up to the front door. Standing there, I wrestled with the idea of knocking on the door and asking about the strange substance, or perhaps calling for help from someone else in town. However, I convinced myself it wasn't my business and that it was probably nothing more than coincidence. With that thought, I chose to turn back and head home instead. As I retraced my steps, the uneasiness remained with me, only growing stronger as time went on. Despite my attempts to convince myself that everything was fine, my gut kept telling me something terrible was happening. Had I made a mistake by not investigating further? Feeling as though my thoughts were driving me mad, I decided to call my friend who lived nearby and seek their opinion on what to do next. When they picked up, their breathing sounded labored, as if they had been running or were under duress. Hey, they started weakly. I don't know what's going on. There's a man attacking people in town. My heart dropped at their words. He's not like anyone we've ever seen before. He doesn't speak in his eyes. They're almost inhuman. They whispered. Realizing that something far worse than we could have imagined was happening before our very eyes, fear began clawing away at my courage as they explained the carnage that was unfolding. It seemed as if this man was unstoppably harming anyone he came across, leaving a trail of blood and disfigured bodies in his wake. Lock your doors, I implored. You should call the police and let them know what's happening. Despite their initial hesitation, my friend agreed. It was time for help. As they promised to call the authorities, we hung up. With every passing moment, our once safe and peaceful town was being consumed by terror. Alone in my own home, my mind raced. Was there even an escape from this monstrous man? Before, I had only been a spectator to the beginning of his reign of terror, ignorant to his trail's true meaning. Now that I was aware of his presence, I felt destined to become one of his victims. Hours seemed to crawl by before I got another call. This time, it was from the police chief himself. By some miracle, they had managed to subdue and arrest the man responsible for the gruesome attacks but at a grave cost. Many lives had been lost that night, people we knew and loved, forever taken from us due to the inexplicable cruelty of one man. We'll make sure he faces justice for what he's done, the police chief assured me. There were no words to express how hollow that solace felt. Our once sleepy town had suffered a devastating nightmare, one that would haunt its residents forevermore. The weight of grief and loss sat heavily on our hearts as we mourned those who didn't survive their encounter with this monster we now called the Silent Slayer. In the days after the ordeal, as we lamented our loved ones' untimely deaths and faced a world forever changed by these events, we also recounted what might have been had someone intervened sooner, had someone paid heed to their gut instincts instead of turning back. While it might not have stopped the tragedy entirely, it haunted me to think that perhaps it could have lessened the damage and saved precious lives. As I walked past the spot where I had once offered my help to the mechanic, a chilling reminder of how it all began, I vowed never to ignore those gut feelings again. I hit the brakes as my truck screeched to a halt outside the old gas station. The sun was setting, casting eerie shadows across the abandoned lot. 
I'd been driving this route between Middlesbrough and Owensboro for years. I'm Zeke Collins, truck driver extraordinaire, always looking for a cheap laugh to keep things light. This dull stretch of road in the bluegrass region offered little entertainment, but my trusty CB radio kept me company. The gas station was barely standing. Peeling paint and boarded-up windows gave it a spooky appearance straight from a campfire story. Given that I was low on gas and no other station in sight, I decided to take my chances. As I approached the pump, I noticed a strange smell in the air, like something rotting nearby. Another trucker named Dalton pulled up alongside me, wearing a grin as wide as his brimmed hat. You smell that too? he asked with amusement. Yeah, I replied cautiously, trying to make light of the situation despite feeling uneasy. Reminds me of that time a raccoon crawled up into my engine bay and really stunk up the joint. Dalton laughed at my joke, and we quickly turned our focus to fueling our trucks. As we pumped the gas, my eyes surveyed the area. I caught glimpses of rusted machinery and weather-worn walls behind overgrown shrubs. What do you reckon's back there? I asked Dalton out of curiosity. Your guess is as good as mine, he replied before tipping his hat goodbye and driving away. As soon as Dalton vanished out of sight, I heard footsteps crunching through leaves coming from behind one of the buildings nearby. My heart raced. Someone or something was out there desperate not to be seen. Mustering my courage, I slowly walked towards the noise like stepping on thin ice, hoping not to break it. Rounding the corner, I found a man hunched over something on the ground. His wiry hair hung in greasy, matted strands, and his clothes were covered in grime. He stopped touching the drooping figure momentarily when I approached. My knees trembled at the sight before me, a bloodied woman with her hands bound, drenched in what looked like her own blood. Hey! I shouted, my voice shaking. What are you doing? Get away from her! The man glanced at me with a sinister expression and a wild look in his eyes before turning his attention back to the body. Fight or flight kicked in as I fumbled for my CB radio, hoping to find someone nearby who could help. But before I could do anything, he lunged towards me with lightning speed, his clenched fists making contact with my face in an instant leaving no space for explanations. I knew I had to act fast if I wanted to survive. With a powerful burst of adrenaline, I broke free from his grip and scrambled back toward my truck while shouting for help through my radio. The burly man's faint laughter echoed through the air as he retreated into the shadows, one last chilling reminder that he was still out there waiting to strike again. My breathing heavy and hands shaking as I heard another trucker's voice crackle on the CB radio. Zeke? What's going on? A familiar fear built up inside me. The realization of what just happened collided with the knowledge that this hulking, violent man might be lurking anywhere around me. My mind raced as I tried to figure out my next move all the while keeping an eye on the shadows for any sign of the man. The trucker on the radio, a guy named Rick, quickly grasped the severity of my situation and promised to alert the authorities. He told me to keep driving and tried to find a safe place to hide until help arrived. I followed Rick's advice and steered my truck down the highway, desperately searching for somewhere that might offer protection. After a few miles... I spotted a small rest area with a few other trucks parked there. Thinking safety in numbers, I pulled in and parked next to another truck. The lot was dimly lit and far from ideal, but it would have to do. I hesitated for a moment before stepping out of my truck, heart pounding, nerves stretched thin. It only took me a few seconds to realize that this prolonged exposure outside wasn't doing me any favors. Feeling vulnerable, I approached one of the other truckers who was walking back to his rig. Keeping my voice low, I quickly filled him in on what had just happened. His eyes widened in alarm as he listened. 
Man, that's insane, he whispered. We'll keep an eye out for him while you wait for help. He even offered me a spare tire iron for protection, not much compared to what that psychopath was capable of, but it was better than nothing. As I paced anxiously next to my rig, still holding on to the tire iron, all I could think about was that poor woman I had found lying there bloodied and helpless. Who was she? Did she manage to escape or did she tragically pass away? My thoughts were disrupted by an oncoming siren sound. Flashing lights filled the night sky. Relief washed over me like ice-cold water when police officers swarmed the rest area. Some talked to the gathered truckers, others searched the area, and a few took my statement. I described the man in detail, from his greasy hair to the sinister glint in his eyes. They assured me that they would do everything in their power to catch this maniac. Once it seemed like everything was under control, a fellow trucker named Bob mustered up the courage to ask about the bloodied woman. What happened to her any word? I shook my head. I don't know. I hope she's okay, but I didn't get a chance to untie her or help before he attacked me. Bob solemnly nodded, patting my shoulder. You did what you could, my friend, he reassured me with understanding eyes. The next few days were tense and filled with anxiety for all the truckers on the road. We constantly checked in with one another, making sure everyone was safe and accounted for while we continued our jobs, transporting goods across the country. Finally, we received the news we had all been waiting for that crazed lunatic responsible for torturing and hurting innocent people had been caught red-handed by the police. Relief washed over us like a wave breaking on shore. Still haunted by that night, I reminded myself of how thankful I was that Rick had acted so quickly. Because of him, lives had been saved by bringing attention to this monster's actions even faster. As for that woman— she was found and rushed to a hospital where she received urgent medical attention. As much as I wished I could have helped more that night, there was some solace in knowing that she lived, and her attacker would be held accountable for what he'd done. I'm just about to start another shift feeling a bit of bile taste in my mouth. That last roadside diner didn't do my stomach any favors. I mumbled, shaking my head. Being a truck driver does take a toll on you sometimes, but I've gotten used to the life. My name is Herschel Dunkirk, and I have been doing this job for over ten years now. Navigating through the backwoods of rural Arkansas, as part of my usual route, I passed some beautiful scenery. It was a big change from the standard highway trips I was used to seeing. That day, however, felt different right from the get-go. It was at this secluded fueling station during one of my breaks when I first saw him. A man standing inconspicuously next to an old pickup truck, his lanky frame leaning against it like it was all he had. Unkempt hair, disheveled clothes, and a five o'clock shadow made it hard to gauge his age maybe forty or fifty? He looked out of place and off in this serene forested area. A strong sense of unease settled over me as I focused on him. As if sensing my gaze upon him, the man suddenly turned his attention towards me. Our eyes locked for a moment before he turned away abruptly and hopped into his truck. Removing his eyes from mine with urgency left me bothered and puzzled. What's up with that guy? I muttered under my breath. A loud bang suddenly echoed around me, disrupting my thoughts. One of the fuel delinquents working here spilled some oil on the ground yet again. I chuckled at their clumsiness while thinking I think someone needs a new career. Shaking it off but still bothered by the odd man's appearance earlier, I continued with my route. Days passed and everything began to feel normal once more, but fate had a different plan in store for me. Driving through the same stretch of road as before, 
I noticed a familiar pickup truck parked by the side with its head open. Immediately, my thoughts raced back to that strange man from earlier. Pulling over to check what was wrong, I hesitantly approached the vehicle. As I got closer, I realized that something was unnervingly strange about this scene. The front of the truck appeared mangled with scratches and dents, some of which were smeared with a dark fluid. It looked exactly like mixed oil and blood. A sickly scent greeted my nose as it wrinkled in disgust. I gathered my courage and shouted, Hey, do you need any help? There was no response. Moving closer, I started to hear faint noises coming from within the truck something akin to soft whimpering. Fear crept up on me mixed with curiosity. Taking a deep breath, I peeked into the window, prepared for the worst, but nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. Lying in the back seat was a woman beaten, bruised, and tied up. The sight made my entire body go numb in shock. It wasn't until she started to move her lips in silent pleads that panic consumed me entirely. Help, please! In my state of frenzy, I didn't notice when footsteps started approaching from behind. The lanky figure of the man loomed over me menacingly as he slowly got closer. Aware of the imminent threat, I fumbled for my phone in my pocket and dialed 911, desperately trying to maintain focus on the situation. I whispered into the phone, There's an emergency. I'm on the road by Johnson's farm. There's a man and a woman in a truck. She's tied up and hurt. I need help immediately. As swiftly as possible, I ended the call and pocketed my phone. With the woman pleading for my assistance, I edged towards her seat window to see if there was any way to help her. The villain continued approaching methodically as if taunting me with his presence. As he drew near, I could see him more distinctly, tall with disheveled hair, a crooked smile full of malice, and sunken eyes that seemed empty of any humanity. He was holding a large wrench in his right hand, and his clothes were stained with dark patches, possibly the same fluid covering his truck. My mind raced with ideas for how to defuse the situation while avoiding being personally targeted by this psychotic man. When he reached the truck just a few feet away from me, he stopped dead in his tracks as sirens blared in the distance. His eyes darted between me, the woman and back towards where the sirens came from. In an instant decision, he sprinted away from us to avoid getting caught by authorities. Unsure where he went but knowing I couldn't waste any more time for fear he might return, I dashed to find something to break open the truck window. Spotting a large rock nearby and remembering not to touch it with my bare hands so as not to mess with any potential evidence left behind by the attacker. I used my shirt as makeshift protection. With adrenaline pumping through my veins, I hurled the rock at the window. It shattered upon impact. Unlocking and opening the door cautiously all while avoiding stepping on the glass shards, I slowly untied the woman, helping her to sit up, still careful not to touch anything that could have been touched by the villain. Tears streamed down her face as she managed to utter a weak, Thank you. We waited in dreadful silence for officers to arrive. When they finally approached with their lights flashing, two officers jumped out and rushed toward us. They quickly assessed the situation. One officer interviewed me while the other officer tended to the woman. An ambulance arrived shortly after, whisking her away for medical care. The police assured me they would investigate the matter thoroughly searching for the man who had caused us so much fear and trauma over this brief encounter. Days later, after several sleepless nights haunted by memories of that harrowing event, I received a phone call from one of the officers on the case. They had captured a suspect, the man I encountered at his truck, and he was now in police custody. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that he wouldn't pose a threat to us or anyone else anymore. The woman, whom I later came to know as Emily, slowly but steadily began recuperating from her horrifying experience. 
The ordeal may have been over for Emily and me, but as time went on, we couldn't help but bookmark these gruesome events in our lives as cautionary tales of how unimaginably dangerous human beings can be. So no matter where life took us afterward, we remained vigilant and wary of unknown threats disguised under normal circumstances. I stood in front of my cabin, nestled in the dense woods of Abernathy Falls, Colorado. Renting this place had become my go-to escape when work became overwhelming. It was isolated, with no internet or cell phone reception, a true getaway. So, here we are again. I muttered to myself, reminiscing about childhood camping trips with my dad. We'd sit around the campfire roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. Those were simpler times. As I unpacked my bags, I spotted a peculiar-looking plant right outside my bedroom window. It seemed somewhat out of place but added character to the scenery. My curiosity peaked. However, I couldn't ignore stomach growling for dinner. Waking up the next morning, I noticed the once-distant sound of running water seemed closer. Grabbing a glass for some water, I was startled by the sound of footsteps outside. Cautiously, I peered around the corner and saw an elderly man trudging past my cabin. Hey! Excuse me! I called out, breaking the twilight silence. He stopped and looked over his shoulder before politely introducing himself as Wallace Stanton. Wallace was a long-time resident of Abernathy Falls and had taken an interest in local flora and fauna. After exchanging pleasantries, he pointed towards the peculiar plant by my window. Curious one, that is, Wallace said. Not native to around here. Before leaving, he invited me to join the weekly town gathering tomorrow evening. He explained it was a place where people shared stories good or bad, from their lives over the years. That night at dinner, I couldn't help but think about my new acquaintance's strange demeanor. It felt like he was concealing something more profound than he let on. The following evening, people filled up a makeshift stage at Abernathy Falls Town Square for the community meeting Wallace had mentioned earlier. As the stories began, it was clear they weren't your usual fireside tales. People spoke of loved ones who had vanished in the woods, strange phenomena that couldn't be explained, and unusual creatures lurking in the shadows. The atmosphere turned grim, as decades-old mysteries and horrors seemingly manifested around us. I felt an icy grip clench my heart as story after story relayed anguish, unanswered questions, and ghost-like presences lurking near Abernathy Falls. When it was finally Wallace's turn to speak, he hesitated for a moment before walking onto the stage. He recounted experiences that confirmed the eerie, unspoken consensus amongst the townsfolk. Abernathy Falls held a dark secret hidden within its desolate wilderness. During his tale, Wallace detailed an unforgettable encounter he had a few years ago when he crossed paths with a terrifying creature deep in the woods a hulking mass of boils and edges coated in thick layers of dirt. Its eyes were jet black like obsidian, its talon-like claws poised to attack. It seemed unnatural and almost hateful in its demeanor. The memory of the monster still haunted him. Each word trembled with fear as he shared this difficult experience. Finishing his horrifying story, Wallace looked towards me, gravely insisting that ominous forces plagued everyone who ventured too far into Abernathy Falls forests. The air was thick with dread as people started to disperse back to their homes to try and forget their shared curse. Dread accumulated inside me like an overflowing well as I walked back towards my cabin beneath moonlight barely illuminating the path ahead. The strange plant I had noticed before seemed different larger and more sinister in appearance, 
than when I first laid eyes on it. It breathed unease into my very soul. Feeling reckless yet desperate to confront my fear head-on, I set out into the woods with nothing but a flashlight to guide me through the darkness. Farther in, the forest's desolate beauty took shape. However, a sinking sensation in my stomach told me that something awaited beyond the edge of my vision. As I stumbled upon a gathering of gnarled trees, the plant Wallace had pointed out earlier caught my eye. The uneasy aura it emitted grew more oppressive as if it were part of an invisible force engulfing Abernathy Falls. Entwined within its unnatural roots, multiple objects glinted like morbid trophies, shards of glass, rusted keys, and eerily misplaced personal belongings. I decided to return to my cabin, realizing that being out in the woods alone at night might not be the best idea. After all, I knew nothing about what could be lurking in the darkness and had no experience with such matters. I gathered my courage and started retracing my steps. As I walked back, I noticed that the forest seemed to have grown colder, almost as if it knew something was wrong. The following day, Wallace went missing. Neighbors searched for him tirelessly. Eventually, his body was discovered near the eerie plant he had shown me earlier mutilated and clearly mauled by a vicious predator. Nobody could explain or identify what had attacked him. As we mourned Wallace's grisly death, our fear of the unknown creature inhabiting the woods around Abernathy Falls increased tenfold. People started arming themselves when venturing out and suddenly we were no longer casual forest walkers but terrified prisoners in our own homes. One evening, I heard Urgen knocking on my cabin door. It was my neighbor Sarah. Breathless and teary-eyed, she'd encountered the creature while returning home from a late-night errand. She described in vivid detail what she saw. It was enormous with matted fur covering most of its body except for patches of severely scarred skin. Its eyes were hollow and penetrating. Jetting from its mouth were numerous blood-stained teeth designed for tearing flesh apart. Though I felt paralyzed by this nightmare coming to life, Sarah urged me to call for help. With shaking hands, I dialed emergency services and explained the situation. They dispatched law enforcement officers to Abernathy Falls immediately. Upon their arrival... The officers interviewed Sarah about her horrific encounter and began conducting daily patrols near our residences. Their presence gave us some solace amidst the terrifying unknown. A week later, two officers ventured into the forest on patrol as night fell a decision that would cost them their lives. Their mangled remains were discovered the following morning, putting the entire community on high alert. The creature's relentless attacks forced us to take drastic measures to protect ourselves. We relied on law enforcement and sought outside help, but the mysterious antagonist evaded capture time and again. We barricaded our windows and doors, abandoning the normalcy of our previous lives. Eventually, an injured bear was found near one of our homes snared in a trap and unable to move. Its gruesome appearance matched Sarah's description of the creature closely. Animal control officers euthanized it in mercy before removing the carcass from Abernathy Falls. Life slowly returned to normal after the bear's death. Everyone assumed that the nightmare was finally over. Yet, I couldn't shake off an underlying sense that we had been victims of something far more malevolent than a rogue predator. To this day... I cannot find the courage to venture into Abernathy Falls Forest alone. The cursed plant still sits there, silently threatening us like a sinister specter of terror, a morbid reminder of what we endured during those dark days. We may never know exactly what attacked us, but one thing is certain. Our ignorance didn't make it any less real or any less terrifying. Whatever it was etched its essence onto our memories permanently staining a once peaceful area with blood-soaked fragments of fear forevermore.
It was just another boring day at the insurance call center where I, Samuel Inglewood, worked for little more than five years. I often found solace in daydreaming about hiking the beautiful mountains of Colorado and longing to stretch my tired legs. As conversations among colleagues turned to weekend plans, I decided that a solitary overnight hike in the woods would be my escape from the mundanity of office life. Resolute in my decision, I began preparations immediately. Maps were consulted, routes planned, and gear carefully inspected. Sam's excellent adventure would commence early Saturday morning from a practically abandoned trail near Crestone Peak Wilderness Area. My adventure started smoothly, amidst tall pines and fresh mountain air. Hours slipped by, and I was silently grateful for the solitude and beauty surrounding me. As the sun sank lower in the sky, I set up camp in a small clearing beside a bubbling brook. That night at the campfire while cooking dinner, an elderly man appeared from a nearby thicket. Evening, neighbor, he greeted warmly. Hiding my surprise at an unexpected company on this isolated trail, I smiled back at him. Evening. You hiking alone out here, too? I, the man replied vaguely. I live not far from here. We exchanged small pleasantries while sharing some food around the campfire. His name was Clarence Hickory, and he told me stories of himself as a young lumberjack who worked these mountains decades ago. Some tales made me chuckle heartily while others caused me to raise my eyebrows skeptically. As we moved on from exchanging stories to discussing recent local events, he informed me about several unexplained disappearances in this area. His voice took on a somber note as he shared how people had gone missing over several months, friends going out for an innocent hike or hunters searching for game only to vanish without a trace. You wouldn't happen to be nosing around looking for clues, would you? Clarence asked, suddenly suspicious. No, I'm just here for a weekend hike. I reassured him nervously. We spoke little after that and eventually prepared for sleep, with me getting comfy in my tent and Clarence disappearing into the darkness as quietly as he'd come. The following morning, I couldn't shake the lingering uneasiness. The day stretched on as I continued trekking further into the forest. As I ventured deeper into the woods, unease grew into fear when I came across the sight of a struggle, broken branches, trampled undergrowth, and ominous dark stains on the ground. My heart raced as I remembered Clarence's stories from last night about the missing persons. Hoping my gut was playing tricks on me, I decided to hurry back down the trail to alert authorities about what I had stumbled upon. Suddenly, a guttural growl filled the air as an enormous wolf-like creature stepped out from behind a group of trees. It stood tall on two legs and towered over me. Its sharp claws looked like they could tear through flesh with ease. The creature had wild unkempt hair with dark intelligent eyes that bore into me like ice. Fear seized me while staring at this monstrosity shambling closer. There was no escape from this nightmare. With no cell phone reception in these woods and no time to even reach into my bag to grab defensive supplies like my pepper spray or knife, I uttered a small cry for help that was ultimately swallowed by the forest. Thoughts of what happened to those people who disappeared flooded my mind. Why didn't anyone mention this creature during our discussions at work or in any local news? It is possible but unlikely that everyone who witnessed this beast would refrain from telling others about their experience due to fear or skepticism about their sanity. Suddenly, piercing yowls erupted nearby, echoing through the trees. Another pair of fierce yellow eyes appeared from behind the creature, making me hold my breath tightly. I trembled as I thought about what might happen next, realizing the true terror menacing these woods. Now facing two terrifying creatures and with no sign of help within miles, 
dread weighed heavily on my chest. Struggling to maintain a composure that was rapidly degrading, I had potential weapons scattered across the forest floor rocks, sticks, anything but knew they wouldn't help against such overwhelming foes. I decided that my only chance for survival was to run. Regardless of the risks, it was better than becoming a mangled mess in the jaws of these creatures. So, I gathered every ounce of courage and sprinted deeper into the woods. The ground shifted beneath my feet as I pushed through the undergrowth. My lungs burned as I gasped for air, but fear propelled me forward. As I stumbled over roots and wet leaves, I heard the creature's guttural growls and heavy breathing chasing me down. Surrounded by darkness and thick foliage, I soon had no idea where I was going. Running blindly through the forest, eventually my foot caught on a rock and sent me tumbling down a slope. My body ached as I collided with dirt, rocks, and various plants on my way down. Upon reaching the bottom of the slope, I could hardly move due to pain and exhaustion. The roars of the creatures seemed to continue for what felt like hours. Eventually realizing they were far away from me now, my mind wandered to different possibilities of them finding my family members or friends. Overwhelmed in thought, I began to lose hope entirely. Moments later, however, distant sirens cut through the crashing cacophony of yells. A search party had arrived just outside the forest's edge probably worried about why I hadn't come back after so long. But trying to get back up the slope was nigh impossible in my weakened state. Desperation urging me on, though, I managed to climb up just enough to make contact with some radio frequencies on my cell phone. Dialing 911 with trembling fingers, I whispered into the phone as urgently yet quietly as possible. They needed to send help immediately for there wasn't much time left before those creatures would find others trapped like me. As it turns out that those very creatures kept following me throughout this ordeal. Silently stalking me while focused on calling for help, I didn't notice them approach until one pounced, biting into my arm while another slashed at my legs. I screamed in pain, hoping my voice carried through the phone to the operator. The pain was unbearable, but my mind fought to concentrate on the likelihood of getting help. The creature's yellow eyes stared at me, viciously intent on finishing the job. My sight blurred with tears as blood continued to seep from my wounds. Still, I used what little strength I had left to kick at them and tried pushing them back. I closed my mouth tightly so as not to alert them further to my awareness and position. As if by divine intervention, the sirens grew nearer. These monsters momentarily paused as loudspeakers blared with urgency and people calling for help. With a disdainful snarl, one creature suddenly lunged at me once more when flashlights and gunshots pierced the darkness of the woods. The creatures howled in fear or perhaps raged before making their escape. With a tinge of uncertainty, I braced myself for impending death by these beastly beings, but it never came. Bloodied and bruised, help had finally arrived in time. Police officers and medics rushed in quickly, attending to my injuries and carrying me out on a stretcher before taking me to the hospital for treatment. Although relieved that the search party had managed to drive off those beasts— I was filled with dread knowing there were two monstrous killers lurking in our town's forest. As the days turned into weeks following the incident, authorities attempted to track down these elusive forest horrors, presumably some type of wolf or similar predator, with little success. Rumors began circulating about humanoid wolf-like creatures roaming our woods. Some even suggested werewolves as a possibility. I never believed in folklore or fantastical stories, but having experienced this traumatic ordeal firsthand, all I could envision was that those sinister yellow eyes belonged to anthropomorphic beings hiding amongst the trees. The images were burned into my mind, 
accompanied by nightmares every time I closed my eyes. While I healed in the hospital and later returned home, I vowed never to set foot in those woods again. But every time I glimpsed their edge from afar, I couldn't help but fear what else might be lurking there unseen. I'm always the last to leave work at the remote research facility in rural Nevada. My name's Avery Marcus' son, and I've been stuck here for three years now. I used to teach biology in Providence, but after my marriage went down the drain, I needed a fresh start. I guess some of us are just better suited for jobs that keep us away from people. I locked the main lab entrance when something caught my eye. A trail of crimson led me closer to where Melinda Greer, the quiet lab technician, lay dead near the storage room door. I pulled out my cell phone and tried to make a call, but there was no reception in this desolate area. Thinking quickly, I ran back to the office and used the landline to dial 911. Hello? My coworker has been murdered at Lakeview Research Facility. Send help. The dispatcher assured me she would send local police, but it would take time. I knew that every second mattered. I returned to Melinda's lifeless body. Something felt off about her appearance. A gruesome pattern had been carved into her skin, resembling claw marks, but unlike any animal attack I'd ever seen. Ignoring the bow rising in my throat, I hurriedly snapped a photo of the markings with my phone. Without warning, a resounding creaking noise echoed from one of the hallways leading deeper into the facility. Heart pounding, I followed it to find Cole Finch, one of our younger researchers, frantically searching through documents on his desk. Cole! Someone killed Melinda! I hissed as quietly as possible. His eyes widened with panic. What? Jesus Christ. We listened silently for any sign of movement or anything that might have made that sound earlier. Cole's hands shook uncontrollably as he clutched a file close. Tears welled up in his eyes as he whispered, Avery, I've discovered something. He hesitated, then continued, Something intelligent and unlike anything we've encountered. It somehow got into our storage facilities. Before I could press for more information, we heard an unnerving growl nearby. My heart raced as we tiptoed back towards the lab. I looked out a nearby window and spotted movement in the darkness. A twelve-foot-tall creature with lupin features was briskly moving away from the facility. As it briefly glanced back at the building, its chilling yellow eyes seemed to connect with mine. That's when it hit me. An old local legend, Philip, the security guard, had told me about one evening over beers a humanoid wolf creature that feasted on human flesh when it roamed these rural lands generations ago. Was this even possible? Come on! I whispered to Cole. We ventured out into the cold night air determined to find answers while still keeping a safe distance from the monstrous being that had emerged from hiding. As if aware of us following it, the creature stopped in its tracks and let out a low-pitched guttural howl before dashing off into the woods at breakneck speed. To my shock and horror, Cole began to chase after it. Out of seemingly nowhere, Deputy Adams appeared, his weapon drawn. Wait! I shouted to Cole. He paused, glancing back at me before realizing he should follow orders and stay put. Adam's eyes narrowed suspiciously at us both as he began asking crucial questions about the facility and what had occurred inside. We struggled to provide coherent answers or make sense of what had just happened when far-off screams in the woods sent a chill up my spine. God damn it! Adams barked as he ran towards the sound without hesitation. We followed him cautiously for what seemed like hours before stumbling upon a grisly murder scene. 
two unfamiliar members of the arriving police force had met their fate in ways that painted their surroundings in unsettling deep red. The claw markings on their bodies were identical to those on Melinda. Unwavering, Adams motioned for us to continue. More local police were nearby, doing their best to remain calm and professional when faced with such carnage. We pushed further through the thick forest, trying our best to flank this menacing creature. It remained silent and elusive as it seemed all at once able to stalk and kill its prey before quickly escaping. As we moved deeper into the woods, the sounds of distant sirens grew fainter and fainter. It was clear that nearby authorities were scrambling to deal with this dangerous situation. Our frustration mounted as the cunning creature continued to lose us in the growing darkness. Stay close, Adams ordered. We tried our best to obey, but fear made it difficult to concentrate on anything but our own dire circumstances. Now and then, we would come across the bloody remains of more slain officers. Each scene was more horrific than the last, and it became increasingly evident that this wolf-like creature was terrorizing everyone who came too near. By now, we should have called for help, requested backup or demanded a SWAT team. But fear inexplicably held us back. We knew what had happened to those who had tried to halt this terrifying beast. Was that fear preventing us from seeking help? It was as if the creature itself instilled a paralyzing terror in its prey, making rational thought impossible. Each of us began to breathe heavily as fatigue set in from our frantic pursuit. Somehow, we marched onwards, determined not to let this monster claim more victims. A feeling of determination gripped us as we pushed on deeper into the woods. Suddenly, a gut-wrenching scream pierced the silence of the night. Our group instinctively broke into a run toward the fading echo. As we drew closer, a grisly scene unfolded before our eyes. Two fellow officers seemingly torn apart by large claws. It looked like an animal attack but worse. It seemed deliberate and calculated. The tension in the air was almost palpable as Adams clenched his teeth before bellowing out orders to establish a perimeter around the area. We spread out cautiously, knowing that doing so might be deadly, but it also meant cornering whatever had been doing this. A snapping branch from above echoed through the forest soon, followed by heavy footfalls on the ground. Within seconds, we were all frozen in place, staring at the horrifying figure that emerged into view. Standing on two legs and covered in coarse fur, it was something right out of a nightmare, a humanoid wolf-like creature with rippling muscles and elongated limbs. Blood dripped from its vicious claws, and its eyes glimmered with a fierce intelligence that sent chills down our spines. Though my mind still couldn't quite comprehend what I was seeing, it seemed obvious that this nightmarish being must be a werewolf. The knowledge offered little comfort given the carnage that surrounded us. Tension pulsed through the air as we prepared for the final showdown. Shots rang out as those officers nearby unloaded their weapons at the monstrous figure. But their efforts seemed only to enrage it further as it let out a bone-chilling howl before lunging toward one of our fellow officers and slamming him into a nearby tree. Adams continued to fire relentlessly while shouting orders to keep shooting at the monstrous thing. It was a frenzy of movement as everyone tried to save themselves while still attempting to stop the creature from claiming any more victims. In unison, another group of officers arrived, presumably having heard more guttural howls and gunfire. Perfect timing. Together, we bombarded the creature with an onslaught that seemed impossible for any living thing to withstand. Finally, overwhelmed by our combined efforts, the werewolf slumped onto the ground. Adams approached cautiously and confirmed its lifeless state with an expression that betrayed both relief and disbelief. We backed away from the gruesome scene before radioing for medical help and backup in dealing with the carnage we had witnessed. Days later, 
after surviving countless interviews and debriefings, we could finally try to make sense of what had happened. With many colleagues dead or injured, it was impossible to ignore the profound impact this creature had had on our lives. To think that such a beast could exist in the world without prior knowledge was a horrifying thought, leaving us wondering what other nightmares lurked in the shadows. The community would not forget the heroics of Deputy Adams and those who had selflessly pursued this monstrous being, or the lives that were lost along the way. In the end, we all vowed not only to remember our fallen co-workers but to continue our vigilance against threats both known and unknown. I hadn't expected my year stationed as a fire lookout in Idaho's remote Selway Bitterroot wilderness to pry open the doors to a dormant fear. My name is Arlen Wyeth. Amongst my new colleagues at the base, I was known simply by my radio call sign, Tango Brevo. It started one crisp October morning when the air bit with a hint of winter's chill. As part of my daily routine, I scanned the horizon through my binoculars from my tower perch. Not a wisp of smoke marred the view, just endless waves of ancient trees swaying softly. But there it was, an anomaly in the natural order, a series of peculiar marks scarring a patch of ground through my binoculars. I kept meticulous logs and reported everything out of the norm. But wasn't this just slightly too curious for a simple note? I shrugged on my parka and decided to investigate personally, a decision that would become lightning rod for what was to come. Navigating through the dense woods grew more laborious as I neared the marks. They were unlike any animal tracks I'd ever seen, deep imprints that suggested something sizable yet without discernible pattern or rhythm. The sun dipped low as I stood amidst the clearing where I had seen the mysterious indentations but an uneasy realization crept in. They weren't tracks but deliberate gouges in earth, something vehemently clawed at the ground here. And within these furrows lay remnants of items, a charred half-burnt identification card, pieces of what seemed like broken tools, each belonging perhaps to prior wilderness stewards like myself. Days passed since that discovery with restless nights spent pondering their origin and intent. Even among fellow lookouts like Karina Stonefield and Lennox Judd, whose experiences outweighed mine by decades, mentions of such markings only fetched puzzled stares or chuckles. Mountain lions get inventive sometimes. Karina quipped over Radio One dusk, trying to inject levity into my unease. But humor soon deserted us all. A week later came another report, signaling disquiet two backpackers missing along one trail close to my tower's sector. An exhaustive search ensued with dogs and volunteers combing through thickets and creeks without so much as a trail sighing. Then on a day blisteringly clear, where blue sky seemed unsettlingly infinite above an indifferent forest expanse below, the grounding crunch underfoot halted all motion. Ensnared by thorny underbrush lay personal belongings, a wallet, a torn backpack strap, artifacts of someone's interrupted voyage into these quiet wilds. The other lookouts and I coordinated with authorities better equipped than us for forensics or searches beyond lost hiker scenarios, yet our tight-knit collective couldn't shake off gloom that settled thereafter like mist shackling mountain peaks at dawn. After the discovery of the abandoned gear, a sense of duty fell upon me. I radioed the authorities, giving them precise coordinates and what little information I had. Dispatch, this is Tower 4. Possible evidence found at location Delta Charlie 1-4-5. Requesting immediate investigation. Over. The response was swift. Roger that, Tower 4. Sending a team to your location. Ensure your safety and do not engage. Over. 
I acknowledged and secured myself within my lookout as night approached. I could see the flashlights of the rescue team far below as they moved through the undergrowth. Hours passed with radio updates fading into static until a brief message broke through, urgent and clipped. Tower 4, containment breach at search site. Alert! Creature, large, bear or larger. Multiple casualties. Assistance required. Fall back to. Static took over. Dawn broke with no further contact. I scanned the horizon for any sign of movement but saw none. Finally, radio chatter resumed. The search team had suffered attacks with serious injuries reported among their ranks. Rescue operations had turned into a recovery mission. I stayed indoors, watching anxiously as more personnel arrived below. They grouped in formation moving with purposeful haste but not before somberly carrying stretchers covered in blood-stained cloth. It was then clear, not all had survived the night. Through binoculars, I caught glimpses of the aftermath, trees torn apart at great height, deep furrows in the earth resembling no animal activity I knew. Lennox came through on the radio with heavy news. Tower 4, this is Lennox at Tower 2. Karina didn't make it through the night. Days became silent after that incident radios barely crackled except for necessary check-ins. We were advised to keep towers locked down after dusk and maintain vigilance during daylight. I followed orders meticulously without venture for closer encounters. As autumn waned to winter, reports surfaced of an elusive creature not known to reside here something unnaturally large and formidable, capable of inflicting horrors that match those tragic nights. With each chilling account from rangers from adjacent sectors converging on our location backed by what I witnessed from my high vantage point of safety, furrows in earth and mangled flora, certainty dawned that something lurked within these woods beyond our understanding or control. And as snow began to fall silently on an eerily calm forest, somewhere in that stillness it roamed free, unseen but ever-present. I remember vividly the summer I took the job as a fire lookout in the Gila National Forest, thinking seclusion would be my sanctuary. My name is Cormac Truitt. I left behind the noise of Albuquerque city life for cabin solitude. This landscape was raw and untouched, promising serene days. My first weeks were spent acclimating to the sounds of nature, replacing car horns with the calls of hawks. Then came July 17th, a day etched in my mind with stark clarity. I was making my usual check on the southern ridge when a foul smell assaulted my senses, decay. Expecting to find a deer carcass left by some predator, I instead stumbled upon an unthinkably gruesome scene, an improvised animal graveyard. The remains were mangled beyond identification. Bears were common here, but this carnage was methodical, unsettling. Tension began mounting with each passing day. Unease took root in my gut as dusk approached with its shadowy embrace. Something lingered in those woods. I felt it on my skin each night as darkness settled and the forest fell silent. On one unexceptional evening as twilight glistened through ponderosa pines, my radio buzzed to life a rarity for someone who not spoken to another soul for days. A ranger named LaRue informed me about recent unusual wildlife behavior reported by other lookouts, erratic movements and migratory patterns that defied normality. In time, it became clear that these disturbances were concentrated around my locale, a chilling fact hard to ignore. Listening determinately for clues over the whispering wind, I realized that what I previously mistook for rustling leaves was actually a subtle sound of something else, methodical pacing from some unseen creature outside. Nights turned sleepless, 
Every pop and crack from the timber-framed lookout post had me reaching for the flashlight. It wasn't until Keaton arrived that things took an unforgettable turn. Keaton being my closest neighboring lookout who tracked over after radio silence from my end went on too long. What he relayed to me couldn't be processed logically. A horrifying recount of something shadowing him in those woods with an intellect that appeared calculating and predatory, but lacked any distinctive form or known animal's physical attributes. Setting up traps was Keaton's proposal. Not to catch but to track what we dealt with since it seemed intelligent enough to avoid direct confrontation with us humans. The tension remained thick and tangible as we reviewed trap locations each dawn only to find them expertly disarmed or circumvented somehow. Our shared mission created a bond, albeit one forged in fear and uncertainty. Jokes about our forest friend were our mechanism to maintain sanity under such abnormal circumstances, a coping strategy that edged towards dark humor bordering on absurd defiance against our situation. Every event built towards a crescendo, cautious steps inching us closer towards understanding or disaster. One could never discern which in these woods, especially at night when every sound magnified into an eerie symphony without origin. Keaton gripped my arm. We need help, he said. I nodded, thinking about the dead radio, the isolation. Help seemed a luxury we couldn't afford. They might not believe us, I said. We'll make them, Keaton insisted. Together, we left the post for town. It was daybreak when we reached it. Our story rushed frantic. The sheriff listened his face stern. We found tracks, Keaton said. Not bear, not deer. A search team formed. They set out with us trailing. In those woods, chaos unfolded quickly. Shouting erupted ahead. Something's there, someone yelled. We found them at a clearing, one man down with flesh torn open, brutal, Savage wounds inflicted by claws either of us saw completely. The creature struck with precision, unseen, swift, and vanished into the trees. Backup came too late for our fallen searcher. His name was Carter. He had two kids. We remembered him in silence later. There was nothing else to do. The sheriff called in state officials men with bigger guns and tranquilizer darts. They spoke to us separately then together again. It's smart, I admitted. We waited days that turned into weeks. There were more incidents. A trap line destroyed. A patrol car clawed on the side like tin foil crumpled up in a giant fist. Then news arrived from miles away. Livestock slaughtered. Similar marks left behind. It wasn't just our problem anymore. State officials decided on a plan involving motion sensors and thermal cameras but gave no promises of success. Keaton and I returned to our posts under strict orders. Stay inside at night and keep watch during the day. We're just bait now, Keaton said over coffee one morning as we looked out at the trees swaying innocently in the wind. And that was life from then on, vigilance without confrontation, while something out there watched us back with eyes we imagined were clever and merciless. No folklore beast or storybook demon, but real flesh and blood with an unknown motive driving it deeper into our nightmares every passing day without end. It's been a couple of years now, but I still check the rearview mirror too often. Can't seem to shake that uneasy feeling that something might be waiting just outside the frame of my vision. That's what happens, I suppose, when you stare into the eyes of pure damn evil and live to tell the tale. My name's Kay Maddox. Used to be a mechanic before, well, before everything. Now, I just drift between odd jobs never staying in one place too long. 
I can fix anything with an engine, work construction, whatever all that matters is the money and putting one more state between me and that damn desert. See, a while back, me and my buddy Silas decided to hit the road up through California and Nevada. Road trips were kind of our thing. Cheap motels, bad gas station hot dogs, listening to tunes you love so much that by the end you swear you'll never want to hear them again. It's the best kind of life there is for a grease monkey with no family to tie him down. One detour led to another, like they always do on those kinds of trips. Before we knew it, we were cruising a highway through Death Valley National Park. I had been before. It's got this stark, alien beauty you gotta see to believe. Silas, not so much, and was gaping out the window at the craggy mountain ridges rising above the salt flats. That's when we spotted the signs Zabriskie Point. Silas gave a shout, and I swerved the truck right over. Gotta hit up the touristy hotspots now and then, right? I parked down in the designated lot, and we grabbed our phones for those cheesy photos you send back home. You know the view, those badlands of crinkled golden hills stretching to the horizon. There was barely a soul around, the mid-afternoon sun too blistering for most folks. For once... I was grateful for the emptiness. Feeling a bit restless, I wandered off from Silas as he fussed about fixing his hair for a selfie. That was the first mistake. Don't get me wrong, the lookout point has railings and signs and stuff. There's not much reason you plummet to your death, unless you decide to get an even better look, that is. Beyond the edge of the paved parking lot, there was this rocky trail leading down into the canyon. Maybe fifteen steps down a slope, and boom, suddenly your view opens up onto a whole other panorama. Seemed worth it to me. That first part of the slope wasn't steep at all, and figuring I could always scramble back up later, I followed. Second mistake. Maybe halfway down, things got steeper. Loose rocks tumbled away under my boots, and I had to grab a scrubby bush to steady myself. That's when I saw it, half hidden in the shadow of a rocky outcrop, a small cave opening. No tourist would likely even notice the thing, hidden away down there. But curiosity gets the better of me sometimes. Figured I'd just take a quick peek at what might be inside. What I found changed my life forever. At first, the darkness and dry, stale air in the cave felt like a relief from the blazing sun. Took my eyes a minute to adjust. Then I made out the pile in the corner. Now, being stranded out in the desert isn't that uncommon. Folks overestimate their vehicles, take wrong turns, get heat stroke, all kinds of reasons you might end up needing rescue. Except when I crouched down next to that pile— it wasn't a heap of abandoned clothing. I realized they were bones. Some bleached, scattered, and not all animal-looking neither. Some of them seemed far too long, the wrong shape, human. I was on my feet with a surge of adrenaline and nausea so fast I'm surprised I didn't hurl all over the rough floor of the cave. That's when I heard it. Not a loud noise— a sort of rustling whisper at the opening of the cave. Something big blocked the sunlight for a chilling moment. I saw it. That's the only way I can think to say it. I saw that tall, lanky form in the fading light, not quite standing upright, a hunched posture like it was straining against its own height. I saw that skin stretch bone tight over its gaunt frame, and those empty bottomless eyes gleaming out at me. Worse, something was in its jaws dripping a red trail and swinging with grotesque motions I swear it was half a human leg. A strangled whimper tore out of my throat, then pure survival instinct kicked in. I bolted. Back up that treacherous slope, the creature behind me with a speed that defied all sense. Each one of those long, clawed hands slapping against the stone, 
It sounded like gunshots at close range. It felt like something was tearing at my back with each stride. I'm no Olympic athlete, never have been. But fear can work miracles. Somehow I stumbled, crawled, and slid my way to the top. Silas looked over in alarm, just a second before the creature burst from the trail behind me. He screamed, ran. I don't know what it did to him. I didn't look back. Car keys shaking in my hands, I got the truck sputtering to life and tore out of the lot. That night, and most nights that followed, were a blur. Abandoned that truck along the side of the highway and never looked back. Didn't stop until I crossed the Arizona border and collapsed in a sleazy motel, news reports about disappearances at Death Valley echoing on the crappy TV. That's when I learned about the missing hiker they haven't found yet. They talk about mountain lions, crazed recklesses out in the wilds. Me, I knew what I saw. There are stories from way back. Folks on the reservations whispering about shapeshifters, things that aren't fully human that walk the desert in search of victims. They call them skinwalkers. Some part of me, maybe the part that's just clinging to sanity, tells me I must have imagined it. But then I remember that putrid stench coming off it and the bloody feast inside its cave of horrors. That was real. The nightmares of those soulless eyes are as real as can be. And the worst part, the thing you folks will never believe, the thing I still swear I can sometimes hear on a lonely stretch of highway at night, it's the rhythmic tapping on the back window of my car like claws against glass. This happened a few years back around the time I got fired from that warehouse job. Figured a solo camping trip might clear my head. Never was much of an outdoorsman, truth be told but I had some time to kill and the Everglades were only a few hours drive away. Seemed like a good way to embrace that classic Florida experience before I started job hunting in earnest. I picked up a few essentials, a cheap tent, some freeze-dried food packs, and a fishing rod because hey, why not? Rented a car, my old truck had seen better days, and headed out to Flamingo Campground one of those places in the southernmost part of the park. Now, the Everglades ain't Disneyland. It's big, swampy, and filled with enough mosquitoes to suck you dry in under ten minutes. I'm not gonna lie, that first night alone I nearly turned the car around and went for a motel in Homestead. But I stuck it out. The second day, I found a rhythm, kind of, Hiked one of the raised trails that crisscrossed the marshlands, tried my hand at fishing, no luck, figures, and grilled some sad-looking hot dogs over the campfire. All in all, not such a bad way to spend some unemployed time. I even saw one of those famous alligators, sunning itself on a log way out in the murky water. That third night was when things went sideways. I was trying to sleep, the tent doing little against the sticky heat and insect symphony outside, when I heard it, a rustling sound, coming from the dense foliage to the west of my campsite. I tried to convince myself it was just a raccoon or some other critter rustling through the brush. But the sound got louder, heavier, like something big was moving out there. The rustling paused, and was replaced by a growl. A low, guttural sound that resonated deep in my bones. I lay frozen in fear, the hair on my arms standing on end. An image popped into my head of those nature documentaries, the ones where the lion pounces on some unsuspecting gazelle. I pictured myself as the gazelle. I debated leaving the tent. But what if whatever was out there was right outside the flimsy nylon? Better to stay put and hope it wandered off. Minutes crawled by. The growl started again, closer this time. I heard a snap, 
like a branch breaking, and then silence. I nearly jumped out of my skin when my cell phone shrilled. The screen read, Nessa, my buddy Nessa, probably checking up on me since I had told her about my little adventure. I fumbled with the phone, my hands shaking. I debated answering, but something in me recoiled at the idea of letting anyone know where I was, what I might have heard. Like I might be inviting trouble if I broke the isolation. Nessa's calls went to voicemail. I lay in the dark, every creak and rustle outside making me flinch. I must have dozed off for a while, because I woke with a start to the most godawful scream. It cut across the still night air, a scream filled with pure, raw terror. I was on my feet instantly. That scream came from the direction of the trailhead, maybe half a mile or so from my campsite. It was quickly followed by another noise, a sickening, wet crunch, then another scream that ended in a choked gurgle. For a moment, the only sound was dripping. Dripping in ragged breathing, heavy and uneven, like someone struggling with every inhale. My survival instincts took over. I wasn't sure what was out there, but it sounded dangerous as hell. I grabbed my pocket knife, Useless, I knew, but it was something, and sprinted in the opposite direction, deeper into the swamp. The ground was soft, spongy, and I stumbled more than once in the near darkness, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. I stopped and listened, every nerve ending on high alert. The crunching sound started again, mingled with a soft slurping noise that turned my stomach. Branches snapped. Twigs crackled underfoot. Whatever was out there, it was moving now, and the sounds were getting closer. I didn't think, just ran. I ran blindly through the dark swampland, the murky water reaching for my ankles with every step, the roots of mangrove trees tripping me up. Thorns tore at my skin, insects whined around my face, but I didn't slow down. Something crashed through the trees behind me, the sound of its footsteps heavy and powerful, faster than mine. I reached a clearing and burst into it, nearly tripping over a tangle of exposed roots. In the center of the clearing, bathed in the faint light of a half-moon, was a structure. An old, wooden observation platform, rotting and half-collapsed. I clambered up the rickety stairs, collapsing onto the damp planks as soon as I reached the top. From the platform, I had a view out over a large swath of marsh. In the distance, I saw a break in the trees, a hint of a dirt road, salvation. My breath started to come back in ragged gasps. Something moved within the tree lean below. A shape, huge and grotesque, stepped out of the darkness. For a moment it was silhouetted against the faint moonlight. It was tall, too tall, and impossibly thin, with long, gangly limbs. Its skin, it looked like it was made of bark, of moss, clinging to a bone-thin frame. Its eyes glowed a dull yellow in the dim light. The creature paused, its head twitching as though sniffing the air. It seemed to be looking straight at me. I squeezed my eyes shut, chanting, No, 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 under my breath. I heard it move again, its footsteps squelching through the mud, circling the platform. I couldn't open my eyes, couldn't bring myself to look at the thing again. Minutes or maybe hours passed. The only sounds were the dripping of water and the steady thrum of my own pulse in my ears. Had it lost interest? Had it gone? I cracked open one eye. The creature was gone. I didn't hesitate. I scrambled down the platform steps and took off running again, blindly back towards the trailhead and that distant glimpse of a road. My lungs burned, my muscles screamed, but I pushed through it. At that moment, nothing else in my life mattered. I just had to get out. I burst onto the road just as the sun started to rise. 
A pickup truck approached, and I waved my arms frantically. The driver hit the brakes, squinting at me like I was some kind of swamp monster myself. Help! I choked out my voice raw. Call for help. Something, something's out there. The driver, a grizzled old guy with a beat-up straw hat, didn't ask questions. He just pulled out his cell and dialed 911, his eyes fixed on the trailhead. The police came. The rangers came. They searched the area. But they found nothing. No trace of whoever had screamed out there in the night. No trace of the creature I had seen. They didn't believe me, of course. They chalked it up to an overactive imagination. Too many gator documentaries. Maybe they were right. Maybe the heat, the isolation, got to me. But I know what I saw. I know what I heard. It's been a while since that trip. I found a new job, moved into a small apartment complex with neighbors close by. I figured I had enough of nature to last a lifetime. Most nights, I sleep just fine. But some nights, I hear those rustling sounds again. And I lie awake under the covers, thinking about those yellow eyes in the dark, and wondering if the thing they call the moss walker ever left the swamp. I never expected that checking the thickets by Big Pine Trail would be more than routine. As a park ranger, I spent years patrolling Yellowstone, dealing with lost hikers and curious wildlife, the usual suspects. It was on a day like any other when the first call came. Cecile Harrow, who'd been known to take long treks, hadn't returned to her campsite. I remember thinking it odd she'd wander off without her pack, which had been found near the edge of Sulphur Springs. The search began with me shouting her name into the expanse of trees and brush. There's something humbling about nature's indifference. You could be screaming at the top of your lungs and the only answer you'd get is the echo of your own voice. I encountered Vernon Stokes next, an old-timer in these parts. He seemed poised to share some odd findings near Indian Pond but insisted on showing rather than telling, unusual for a chatterbox like Vernon. As we trudged through damp undergrowth, Vernon kept glancing over his shoulder like he expected the trees themselves to yank him backward. The tension in his movements betrayed his usually mellow demeanor. He mentioned tracks unlike any he'd seen a sequence of deep indentations lacking a discernible pattern or rhythm. Arriving upon a small clearing, that's when I saw it, an undisturbed stretch of mud bearing unfamiliar, massive imprints leading toward the thicket where Cecile's belongings had been cleared away as evidence, a too small barrier against the unknown. I radioed in for additional personnel, my hand holding the button down longer than necessary. No response crackled through. That wasn't just abnormal. It was unprecedented given our state-of-the-art communications equipment designed specifically for this rugged terrain. Evening drew close with fog rolling in from Lake Yellowstone as if to obscure more than just land and water but truth itself. Without backup and losing daylight, I continued alone propelled by this unsettling line of prints which now appeared deliberately shielded underneath branches nigh perfect for concealment. An unsettling thought gnawed at my logic. Someone, or something, was intelligent enough to mask its trail. That realization settled heavy in my guts just as much as Vern's abrupt departure back to headquarters pleading urgent paperwork suddenly remembered. Was he cowing out or sensible enough to not provoke what lay beyond? The vegetation grew denser, and branches became hands that clawed at my uniform while whispers of dropped leaves painted a cacophonic canvas around me. Then it happened. One moment was utter silence, and the next was an eruption from the foliage ahead. In moments like these they teach you tactics and control. 
how to aim your firearms steady despite your heartbeat thundering in your ears. They don't teach you about moments where the creature before you defies explanation, a hulking silhouette sparse on fur with limbs contorted at wrong angles for any species listed in natural guides. My mind frenzied for answers while vocal cords locked up strict, as if confronted by eldritch folklore made flesh, the guidebook in my brain throwing up page after missing page for what this spectacle could possibly hail from. There were no roars or growls typical of mountain predators. Instead, an unsettling silence enveloped us before it moved with jarring quickness, a blur almost too swift for human eyes, clawing swathes of earth round itself in territorial rage. I froze. My hand hovered near the radio fixed at my hip, but doubts seized me. A call for backup with such vague details would draw ridicule or worse, a wild goose chase draining resources. I lacked a clear description of the creature disrupting the forest equilibrium, only fleeting impressions of size and malformation. The silence broke when branches snapped. The creature lunged. Its misshapen body barreled toward me, and I turned, sprinting back toward the path from whence I came. Terrain that once seemed familiar was now an obstacle course of roots and rocks. I glanced back only once to see its eyes catching the scant light, lifeless yet fixated. Its limbs threw dirt and detritus with each stride, displaying a grotesque power. Twisted paws, incorrect for any known wildlife, attacked the ground, propelling it forward with frightening momentum. Fumbling at my belt, I managed to yank free my whistle and blew sharp blasts as I ran. The sound pierced the forest's quiet canopy, a beacon for attention. I heard shouts then, two figures approaching from a distance, rangers on routine surveillance drawn by my frantic signaling. They froze at the sight behind me and acted without hesitation. Up! One of them yelled to me as they both scrambled up the nearest trees with speed borne from practice. I followed suit just in time to avoid the creature that barreled past, blind to our ascent. It circled below us, contorting its frame in feral frustration before disappearing back into the woods with a silence more unsettling than any commotion it had caused. We waited long minutes ensuring its departure before descending to solid ground. With no visual confirmation in closing minutes nor clear understanding of what patrolled our forests, we reported only an unidentified animal encounter. That night three rangers filed papers cautioning areas for controlled access until further notice, a decision not taken lightly over paper piles at headquarters. From then on shifts included pairs, no excuses, and collated reports from decades past to account for patterns previously dismissed. The trail where I encountered it became less traveled. Rangers warned visitors anecdotal tales of dangerous wildlife without specifics lest we stoke undue panic. There were hushed conversations between colleagues concluding only in wild speculation some biological curiosity emerging an undocumented species or perhaps an anomaly of nature pushed to adaptation's edge. We bore scars forged from shared ordeal. Mine lay beneath flesh while others carried loss such deeper within. Friend quit weeks later seeking employment distinct from wilderness and shadowed trails. In twilight hours those who remained wrestled with curiosity that pulled against duty's restraint when gazing upon maps marked with red pins denoting CAUTION Each hope not for answers but for peaceful coexistence with whatever walked amongst knots and leaves, with senses sharpened against uncertainty's veil. We guarded our forest more diligently honoring victims taken before knowledge could unfold a realization offering scarce comfort alongside a lingering enigma as immense as untouched woods sprawling under stars' silent vigil.
I always believed the wilderness held secrets, but nothing prepared me for what I encountered in the thick forests of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in Minnesota. It started like any other crisp morning as a park ranger. My name is Jonas Cleeton, and rangers like me were familiar with the solitude of the great outdoors. It was while checking on reported trail damages that I stumbled upon a chilling sight, an array of oddly arranged stones which in my years of service I'd never encountered. The scene resembled a ritualistic formation, one that shouldn't exist in this untouched part of the forest. I radioed for Ranger Mariah Foss and Delbert Meyer to join me, thinking it might be some pranksters on a prohibited jaunt, but neither replied. It wasn't unusual given the patchy reception. Upon further inspection, I discovered personal belongings strewn about, wallets, torn pieces of clothing with barely legible names like Consuela Grieg or Terrell Noden, indicating missing persons. My gut feeling urged caution. Yet I pressed on deeper into the woods. Soon, whispers of stories from old-timers came back to me, hunters and hikers vanishing without trace, dismissed as tall tales until now. When Foss finally responded to my calls with a panic-tinged voice reporting bizarre screams near Lake Saganaga, we agreed to meet there at once. The surroundings morphed rapidly as I trekked towards Saganaga. Tranquility gave way to an unshakable sensation of being watched and followed. Crunching leaves would cease whenever I did, an impenetrable fog rolled in despite forecasts promising clear skies. A series of deep, guttural snarls abruptly cut through the eerie silence as I approached the meeting spot. Mariah's shouts pierced through the fog before ending abruptly mid-cry. Just then, illuminated by my flashlight through the creeping mist was a glimpse of something monstrous amidst the ancient trees— Tall, gaunt, and oddly humanoid but not quite, its skin bore an ethereal quality akin to pallid moonlight. No eyes were visible on its elongated face, but I knew it saw me, sensed me. I didn't dare fire my weapon. Such a visceral intuition told me bullets wouldn't dent whatever this creature was. My training advocated deterrence over engagement with wild animals yet this entity defied all logic. Ignoring every instinct screaming inside me not to following into Mariah's last known location would have been professional negligence no matter the fear gnawing at my sanity. With no time to process the sight, I turned and ran. Every step away from the creature took monumental effort as underbrush grabbed at my legs. I aimed for the ranger's station miles back, the only place I could secure myself and radio for help. Amidst the chaos, my mind registered a clear thought. Mariah did not make it. The station came into view. I locked myself inside, barricaded the door with whatever was at hand, then grabbed the radio and sent out a distress signal. Mayday, mayday, this is Ranger Station Delta at Lake Saganaga. I gave coordinates and requested immediate backup. The wait was unbearable. Noises outside grew louder, more sinister. When backup finally arrived, what they found shook them to their core. Tracks led everywhere but offered no clues as to their maker. In broad daylight, we set out with armed reinforcements in search of Mariah. Her fate became clear upon discovering a scene of struggle near some brush. Clothing fragments lay scattered among untouched equipment— it was all that remained of her. The days that followed blurred together as teams surveyed the area, finding nothing of import, no creature sightings, no additional evidence. Ultimately, the official report listed an unidentified animal attack as cause and caution for all personnel in the region increased tenfold. Debates ensued about potential undiscovered local wildlife or a foreign species migration conclusions remained elusive. From then on, patrols doubled. Each step within those woods bore an undercurrent of unease. 
Saganaga's mystery creature became something between legend and warning, a memory scarred into Park Service folklore without a name or face beyond what little I witnessed that day. Mariah's family received my personal account along with condolences from our entire team, though it did little to ease their loss or answer questions about her final moments. In nature's grandest stages lie scenes fraught with beauty and terror alike. Saganaga now epitomized both. Myself part of its tapestry of unanswered tales despite never seeking such infamy. Hello there. My name is Arlo Beckwith and driving trucks is what keeps my world turning. It happened on a barren stretch of Route 50, known as the loneliest road in America. The Nevada sun had sunk below the horizon, and I was following the beam of my headlights into the night. The cargo was a simple delivery from one warehouse to another. Just me, my rig, and miles of asphalt ribbon unwinding ahead. That evening was like any other, until I found a beat-up car abandoned hazards faintly flickering as if struggling to draw its final breaths. Something urged me to stop and check it out. Maybe it was the quiet solitude or curiosity biting at me. The car looked like a scene right out of those detective stories my granddad used to tell. Doors ajar, keys still in the ignition but no owner in sight. With a sense of unease growing inside me, I called out but received only silence in reply. I radioed for help, figuring someone should know about this. My signal crackled and died before the message could leave my lips. No roadside assistance or police cruisers would be gracing this scene. With cellular dead zones common out here in the expanses, finding no signal wasn't a shock. Still, it left me feeling uneasy. Now I'm not one for detective work. Give me an open road over a mystery any day. But something about that car pulled me in deeper than common sense would advise. A couple paces from the vehicle led to personal items scattered across the ground, a crumpled map of Nevada, some snap sunglasses, and what looked like a family photo now tinged with red stains. Venturing further from where the car sat marooned off-road seemed like stepping into another world entirely one where every gravel crunch underneath my boots sounded like whispers floating on the desert wind. Then I heard rustling, real or imagined, and spun around to see nothing behind me but an endless expanse of darkness punctuated by pale moonlight shadows. That's when I felt it not fear precisely, more like an awareness that something immeasurably wrong had burrowed its way into this particular piece of nowhere. This feeling became concrete when shapes moved just beyond the reach of my flashlight, a sort of shifting dance that made my grip on reality falter for a heart-stopping moment. Yet there was no time for dwelling. Heavy footsteps surged toward me from behind. I turned to face him, my pursuit malevolent beyond doubt now. The silhouette that stalked closer was tall and broad-shouldered, wearing a brimmed hat that cast his face in shadowy enigma. Jacket flaps open to the desert breeze revealing worn jeans over heavy work boots, standard attire for wandering souls in these parts, yet this man exuded menace rather than mundanity. In vain did I reach for words while backing away. His approach neither hurrying nor halting felt measured like an inevitable tick towards some ghastly conclusion written in stars that one cannot read until too late. The chase led me into a treacherous game of cat and mouse amidst abandoned mine shafts speckled throughout the Nevada desert, a dark testimony to human efforts once fervent now forgotten. With each desperate turn ducking into shafts so steep they'd make lesser men weep, I narrowly avoided my silent assailant's attempts to corner his prey, myself being unfortunately cast in that role tonight. It must have been hours or merely minutes. I couldn't tell, 
as we wove through derelict structures once homes to tales of gold and prosperity now dust-laden epitaphs echoing wails of their past lives. Deeper I went driven by primal urgency until faced with two paths, one veering left plunging down into fathomless black and another ascending towards what? Salvation or merely another circle in this hellish loop? I chose left, plummeting into darkness, feeling for walls slick with condensation. My fingers grazed loose stones and I stumbled over timber supports long since given over to rot. The footing was treacherous. A slip would spell disaster. Behind me, pursuit was relentless. Footsteps heavy on the decayed rungs of ladders we descended. The air grew thin, oppressive, and still the man followed. I emerged onto a ledge. Below lay black water reflecting back the scarce light filtering from shafts above. No path forward. A noise alerted me to his presence, closer now than ever before. I risked a look back and caught a glimpse of the man amidst shadows, broad-shouldered, leather skin taut over a gaunt frame, eyes hollow yet bright with intent. No phone signal here to cry for help. I knew that much without checking. Besides, echoes of my voice would serve as a beacon for him to pinpoint my location amid this labyrinthine underworld. Adrenaline urged me forward, into the water or back towards the man. Neither offered salvation. I dove. The cold embraced me fully as I swam beneath the surface towards what I prayed was another side. When my hands finally grasped rock and I pulled myself out, I found a cavern, an exit barred by rusted iron bars. Trapped. A shuffle behind made my breath catch. There he stood at the edge of water, looming presence that seemed to consume what little space remained between us. I backed against the bars as he began to wade into the water, deliberate steps causing ripples that mirrored his slow intent. Why? was all that managed to escape my lips before he reached his arm through the bars towards me. He did not answer. Instead his hands found their way to my throat. Struggle though I might, he was strong, too strong. When I woke up gasping for breath, daylight broke through an entrance high above where water trickled down in streams reflected on cavern walls. He seemed gone. My neck hurt and bore marks where fingers had pressed deep. Out of necessity more than bravery, I climbed toward daylight using juts and crevices in the rock until my hands breached surface at last and desert sun bore down upon my face. Days passed before I gathered courage to venture out among people again, too long spent in expectation of his reappearance from shadows around every corner. Ultimately no one could corroborate my story with evidence nor identify my attacker when I described him, that man carved from desert hardship who smelled of earth and iron, a stranger possibly named Tom based on an engraving inside the leather band of his hat which must have fallen during our struggle in depths below. His identity a mystery despite months of inquiry by local authorities after someone found an old miner's hat left behind in a forgotten desert shaft, none the wiser to its significance. I live each day now knowing somewhere out there he roams still, a predator amongst men, and while fortunate to have escaped with life intact as others might not be so lucky— Fear has become an ever-present companion whispering cautions with every stranger's glance or unfamiliar noise at night. For those lost souls who met their fate at his unforgiving hands vanished without echo amongst Nevada's vast openness are remembered only by ghost towns they once sought fortune within. Their hopes abandoned as mine were in those forsaken minds where echoes now speak only of survival and escape. Every day blends into the next when you're behind the wheel of a big rig, hauling cargo across the vast expanses of America. I'm Jasper Talone, 
long-haul trucker by trade, and I've seen more of this country's highways and byways than I can recount. My hauls take me to all sorts of remote places most people never wander into, places like Bixby Canyon in Arizona, with its desolate beauty and daunting cliff sides. That's where I found myself, on an otherwise routine delivery, it seemed like just another run. The desert stretched wide around me as I navigated my 18-wheeler along the sparse road, nodding along to some tunes that broke the monotonous hum of my engine churning through miles. My latest drop-off had put me behind schedule, a pesky loading dock issue back at some forgotten warehouse in a town whose name already escaped me. Midday heat played tricks on the horizon as I neared a service station, a pit-stop oasis where truckers could grab a bite or catch a wink before returning to the endless tarmac sea. My stomach dictated a break for sustenance so I pulled over, the large edifice casting a lonely shadow in this sunbaked nowhere. I stretched my legs while pumping diesel and exchanged nods with Gideon Hayes, the owner who ran this lonely outpost. He was an older gent, wiry with eyes that had seen too much sun and not enough shade. A few muttered words about sports scores and road conditions were all we spared for small talk before I headed inside for some grub. As I replenished, other truckers came and went with silent acknowledgments, each absorbed in their own transient world, until he walked in. This ominous figure stood out awkwardly amongst us, tall with an imposing stature, his facial features obscured under the brim of an old tattered hat. Clad in sun-faded denim, he moved through the diner without ordering, without speaking to anyone. His eyes, though hidden, seemed to scan with deliberate intent. Back on the road again as daylight started its retreat. The CB radio crackled alive occasionally, but no voice rang out just static squawks breaking up the twilight silence. I kept glancing at my mirrors for any sign of life behind me. Truckers tend to find comfort knowing there's someone else out there. Out here in these isolated stretches is where your mind plays games. You imagine things that aren't there. Or so you tell yourself. So when an odd series of lights began tailing me from a distance when night fell proper and solitude weighed heavy against my rig's cabin frame, I chalked it up to fatigue persuading my eyes to lies. But those lights drew closer, too close, and my skepticism waned as trepidation seeped into its place like cold through thin clothes. This was no ordinary fellow traveler maintaining safe distance. Rather incredibly precise maneuvers followed each turn of my steering wheel, a peculiar tandem dance along this deserted asphalt stage. Then came noises above idle engine roars. Taps. Clicks. They sounded almost deliberate against my trailer's side panels pacing alongside down this barren stretch heading towards Flagstaff's outskirts under moonlight devoid of warmth and solace. A close pass shaved breath from my lungs, a vehicle veering suddenly off course then crunching gravel before regaining pursuit, a relentless metallic echo whispering threats through cold air dissolving any notion of happenstance. I reached for my phone instinctively, only natural to call for help, but between dead zones voiding signal bars and second-guessing invading thoughts questioning if threat was real or figment born from road weariness, a decision lingered unmade while intimidation on wheels lurked unnervingly near. It feels like hours stretching into impossible eternity between moments of checking mirrors trying to glimpse just who, or what, is commanding this unwelcome nocturnal escort driving tension deeper into muscles knotted tight from white-knuckle grips battling steering wheel resistance. The pursuit continued. I could see in the mirror that the driver kept a mask over his face, all black with holes cut for eyes. No license plate on his car meant no ID. This was planned. Heart pounding, I scanned for any sign of life. A house, a gas station, anything. Nothing. Then he rammed the back of my trailer. 
Metal shrieked as it buckled. Another hit, harder this time. The trailer fishtailed, and I fought for control. Ahead there was a fork, left towards town, right into deeper darkness. I veered left. He followed. The truck's cabin was now in range. This close I saw the headlights of his car were taped over except for thin slits, like predatory eyes. The engine of his car growled louder as he closed in again. One more hit and my trailer would lose it or flip it. Desperation set in but I kept driving, faster now than safety should allow. My phone still showed no bars, too remote for a signal. Then light, a diner not yet closed. Gravel sprayed as I swerved into the parking lot and honked the horn continuously to draw attention. People looked out from the diner windows as he came to a skidding halt behind me. Seconds turned to minutes as we sat there, me with horn blaring and him motionless behind me. Finally, doors opened from the diner and people stepped out cautiously toward us. The masked driver revved his engine fiercely one last time before peeling away into the night, gone as quickly as he'd come. I noted everything I could, the build of the car, it was an older sedan. Something about that mask struck me but didn't yet place it. The diner owner called the police while others checked on me and inspected my damaged trailer. Cops arrived, took statements, and began their investigation. They mentioned similar incidents lately. Suspects targeted lone drivers for unknown reasons. Days later they found the sedan abandoned with no traces to follow. Save for one thing, a flyer for a local wrestling event crumpled in the footwell with one wrestler named the Highwayman wearing that same menacing mask. I never learned more than that before leaving town eager to shake off what had happened but always checking mirrors for masked followers ever since. This happened to me a few summers ago in Green Bank, West Virginia. I had decided I needed a break from the city and settled upon this isolated region in my quest for silence. My name is Harrison Wexler, and I'm a struggling writer trying to connect with my inner artist. Upon arriving, I discovered my temporary home was nestled among dense woods. The locals were few and I befriended one by the name of Sheldon Hargrove. He was a gruff man, living alone, but he welcomed me. He shared how people came here to escape modern technology since receiving signals were futile in a radio-quiet zone. Despite my love for isolation, an uneasiness crept into my mind as a newspaper headline captured my attention. Five Missing, Search Unfruitful Adrenaline surged through me as the unnerving story unfolded. Local authorities seemed baffled with this newest addition to an ongoing string of disappearances. Over the course of two weeks, strange incidents piled up. One morning, I found large scratch marks on my cabin door accompanied by an indescribable odor that clung to the wood like a starving leech. No native creature could have left such scratches. I voiced these concerns with Sheldon and showed him the door as evidence. He scratched his head uneasily but offered nothing more than speculation on wild animals or some sick prankster. It wasn't until our trip into the woods that we encountered the horrifying truth. We were tracing our way back when heavy footfalls neared us from behind. Sweat dripped down my brow as I peeked over my shoulder. What I saw defied reasoning. My heart raced as we stared down an abomination of nature, part man, part beast, with strands of matted hair cascading over rippling muscles. This predator towered above us with snarling teeth and blood-red eyes that glinted with malevolence. There was no time for a single logical thought. We bolted through the woods, the sound of its heavy breathing pounding in our ears. Our desperation lent us speed, and I managed to fire off a round from my revolver, 
but it was like shooting into air. We stumbled out onto the highway where passing motorists could see us. We collapsed against my car, gasping for air as whatever had chased us seemed to stop just beyond view. We watched the woods, now fully aware of the sinister reality that lurked within. Instead of calling for help, we opted to stay silent. What would others think of such a tale? It was laughable and terrifying all at once. Our lives took an uncertain turn as paranoia settled over Green Bank. We remained inside our homes, too fearful to venture into the darkness haunted by the unspeakable beast. Were we becoming prisoners in our own oasis away from civilization? The creature continued to torment us, weaving a web of horror that stretched across generations. Each night brought new surprises, from haunting screeches echoing through the quaint town to mutilated corpses discovered at its fringes. The monster's horrific acts resembled performance art or grotesque installation pieces, designed to chill the souls of anyone gazing upon them. As silence reigned over Green Bank once more, whispers circulated among the locals, each story more gruesome than the last. It became impossible for even Sheldon and me to ignore the troubling theories that implicated us as having something to hide. The grainy truth started fermenting like abandoned moonshine barrels when my dear friend Sheldon turned up missing one night, disappearing without a trace just as mysteriously as he had entered my life. I committed myself relentlessly in search of answers about my friend's fate discovering impossibly twisted trails that led further into darkness with each step. With every foray into those haunted woods, I grew closer to confronting him again, the nameless nightmare that terrified and dominated our lives. Inescapable fear and dread wrapped around me like a suffocating fog, my desperate search eating away at my already threadbare sanity. Each gunshot echoed as gun smoke filled air, leaving a bitter aftertaste in my mouth. Time dragged painfully as if to mock me in this unending nightmare. With the town paralyzed by fear, we tried our best to carry on with our daily lives despite the ever-growing threat. Businesses closed earlier, children played indoors, and everyone locked their doors as soon as darkness fell. The creature remained elusive, leaving only destruction in its wake and those who ventured out late at night risked a gruesome fate. Desperate for answers about Sheldon's disappearance, I decided to confide in Maggie, his sister. We sought out safety in numbers, staying together, and even sharing a room at night. One evening, while huddled under the dim light of a single candle, I shared my suspicions concerning the creature that I believed was responsible for the murder and mayhem plaguing Green Bank. I don't know what it is, I admitted to her hesitantly. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. It's a monster. It's fast, murderous, and appears to have some ability to change its form. Maggie listened intently, contemplating my words for a moment before suggesting we try something drastic, calling in outside help. But even that idea seemed futile, who would come to help a tiny town like Green Bank? Who would believe our increasingly strange story? We ultimately decided against seeking external assistance, instead choosing to rely on one another until we could no longer do so. Only days later did another attack on unsuspecting locals force us to reconsider our predicament. A young couple had been killed by the creature on the edge of town their bodies mauled and left unrecognizable. Interrupting my restless sleep that night came an urgency within me that compelled me to confront this entity directly. It seemed foolish at first why would a common man like me dare take on such a malicious being. But perhaps there lay my advantage. It wouldn't expect resistance from someone like me, someone very much aware of their insignificance. I walked through the silent house, pausing to look at Maggie as she slept peacefully, completely unaware of my decision to face the creature. 
I took a deep breath and stepped into the darkness outside. Each footstep felt heavier than the last as I followed the vague path to where I believed the creature would strike next. My senses heightened almost supernaturally. The night was eerie quiet, but even that couldn't mask the chilling truth. I had become prey. As it emerged from behind a nearby tree, it was all I could do not to freeze in pure terror. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen, muscular with grotesque features that seemed to morph before my eyes. Perhaps it was a skinwalker or shapeshifter. There was no way for me to be certain. But somehow, against all odds, I felt an inexplicable surge of courage and determination. With furious adrenaline coursing through me, I charged at the creature with a yell. It looked at me with an almost human-like grin before revealing its horrifying sharp teeth and lunging toward me. Our battle lasted what seemed like hours, though it was undoubtedly mere moments. Just when I thought I would succumb to defeat and certain death, something unexpected occurred. Suddenly, screams rang out in the distance and bright lights pierced through the shadows of the woods. The creature's snarls were quickly replaced by howls of pain as its attention diverted from me. My insane attempt had drawn attention. Brave townspeople banded together in unified desperation had driven off this nightmare that had gripped Green Bank so tightly. Exhausted and injured, but incredibly alive, I watched as my fellow citizens cautiously surrounded me their fear slowly transforming into relief at having found our common enemy. As they helped me embrace my newfound gratitude for life, we realized that this ordeal was over, at least for now. Though we knew little about the monster which had plagued us all or where it may have retreated, we unanimously decided to join forces, using what limited knowledge and resources we possessed. The creature's victims— including my dear friend Sheldon, remained ever-present in our minds as we vowed to honor their memories by preparing for and facing any future horrors that might arise. Though time would eventually bring us answers surrounding this creature of nightmares, we would never forget the terror it wrought upon Green Bank or the strength and unity that rose out of such desperation. This happened to me one summer in a secluded region of Wyoming called Sinks Canyon. My name is Lyle Norquist, and I am an engineer by profession. I'd taken a temporary break from life to explore a more rural existence, inspired by my late uncle who'd always encouraged me to try new things. My best friend, Tegenmar, accompanied me, and our days were filled with fishing and hiking. The two of us often joked around, pondering the odds of the universe creating two people with such uncommon names who would forge a lifelong friendship. A few weeks into our stay, we noticed something strange, an abandoned truck at the edge of the woods with blood-smeared windows and what appeared to be claw marks on its side. We speculated that it could belong to one of the many missing persons reported in the news lately. As days went by, our conversations turned more serious. Calls for help rang through the canyon, but no cell service existed in this remote location. Even if we wanted to contact someone, it was just not possible out here. Tegan and I began discussing our own personal lives and backgrounds as we grew closer. The more time we spent together, the more wary we became of our surroundings. What had begun as a tranquil escape now felt eerie and uncertain. As the sun set one evening, we stumbled upon another gruesome crime scene, a mutilated body strewn across an isolated campsite. It wasn't long before we recognized the victim. It was Bill Grayson, an acquaintance from town whose name was just as rare as ours. We continued discovering ghastly scenes as though being taunted by some unknown force. We attempted to piece every detail together in order to make sense of these horrifying events 
that seemed too twisted for reality. One night, cautiously exploring deeper into the woods than before, we came face to face with an unnerving animalistic creature, hulking, feral, and covered in matted fur. It emitted a low growl that sent a shiver down my spine, causing both Tegan and me to freeze. Its eyes glowed in the darkness, and its mouth dripped with what appeared to be blood. We sensed that it was strange, menacing, but it seemed almost familiar. Tegan whispered to me, Could that thing be responsible for everything here? The missing people, the crime scenes, Bill? We stared at each other in disbelief that such a creature could exist and cause such havoc. We wanted to run but stayed rooted to the spot. As if sensing our fear, the creature lunged at us suddenly, revealing its sharp teeth and huge claws as it barked out a terrifying guttural screech. A desperate thought crossed my mind. I considered using my gun that I had brought along for protection against wildlife. But an inner voice told me that bullets would hardly affect this malicious being. It was too powerful for any conventional weaponry. As we tried our best to avoid provoking the beast further, it seemed uninterested in starting a conversation. Instead, it licked its lips hungrily as it stalked closer towards us. Tegan and I backed up slowly, pondering possible escape routes while exchanging nervous glances with each other. Tegan grabbed my arm, and without a word, we made a silent pact to try to outmaneuver the creature. The beast seemed to anticipate our every move, blocking our potential escape routes as we inched along the edge of the clearing. My hand shook as I grasped the unused gun, its presence in my hand both comforting and haunting. Suddenly, the creature dashed towards us, its muscular legs propelling it with incredible speed. In a split-second decision, I aimed the gun at the ground near the creature's paws and fired. The bullet struck dirt and rocks, sending debris flying into the air. The noise proved distracting enough to momentarily halt the beast's advance, providing us with just enough time to make a run for it. We sprinted as fast as our legs could carry us through the dark woods. Our breaths came in desperate gasps. Fear and adrenaline propelled us forward. I knew we needed help urgently but we were miles away from any human settlement or cellular reception due to our remote location. As we stumbled over roots and branches in our frantic attempt to get away from the pursuing monster, I noticed a small cabin up ahead through the trees. We scrambled towards it without thinking. Anywhere seemed better than being out in the open with that thing chasing us. Once inside, we collapsed on the floor panting hysterically. Wasting no time, Tegan began searching for anything we could use to barricade ourselves in, some heavy furniture, perhaps. All I found was an old-looking book on one of the dusty shelves, a book which was too frail and ancient-looking to be of any practical use. By pooling our limited resources together and pushing a heavy table against the door while stacking chairs on top of each other in front of windows— we managed to fortify ourselves inside as best as possible under such dire circumstances. The night dragged on at agonizingly slow pace. Every sound, every rustle, outside made us jump. At some point, we realized that we might be safer staying hidden in the cabin than trying to call for help. True, it might have eventually led to rescuers coming for us but it could also alert the creature to our whereabouts. As dawn broke the following day, we knew we couldn't stay hidden inside any longer. As silently as possible, we unstacked the chairs and carefully moved the table away from the door. The woods greeted us with an eerie silence. Nothing stirred apart from the soft morning breeze rustling through leaves. Determined to get as far away from this place as we could, we set off towards our base camp, which was several miles away along a winding forest trail, praying that help could be found there. The entire journey was spent in constant terror of our pursuer. 
Every creaking tree branch or flutter of bird wings sent our hearts racing. Miraculously, though, we reached our base camp without any further encounters with the monstrous being that had haunted our nightmares. Never before had I felt so relieved in my life. Tears streamed down my face as I struggled for breath upon reaching the safety of familiar surroundings. That horrible creature remained a mystery to Tegan and me, its origins or purpose known only to itself should it have possessed the ability to ponder such things. All I could think of regarding its existence was that it might have been some sort of skinwalker or shapeshifter, a shape-changing entity not entirely unlike old legends warned against. One thing is certain, Bill and all those poor souls who went missing before us fell prey to something beyond human understanding. There are monsters in this world that prey on those who stumble into their territory, things never meant for human eyes to see nor human hearts to comprehend. Some secrets were simply meant to remain hidden within dark forests forever. I'll always carry those memories with me. The horrifying image of that feral creature, its seething presence in the shadows, and the loss of our dear friend. It's a nightmare I wish I could forget, but it's a stark reminder that there are some horrors in this world that cannot be easily explained or brushed aside. And sometimes, to survive such horrors, we must accept that life and the world around us are infinitely more complex and terrifying than we could have ever imagined.